industry. But with no commercials, how is C-SPAN funded? Public funding. Private individuals. I'm assuming it's funded by the government. I believe it's publicly funded. Well, I haven't seen Telethon, so I'm not really sure. Corporate sponsorship. Uh, by cable companies. That's right. For nearly 30 years, America's cable companies have been providing C-SPAN programming to you commercial-free as a public service. Next, a House hearing on HIV-AIDS infection in the U.S. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that there were 56,000 new HIV infections in 2006. Witnesses include Dr. Julie Gerberding of the CDC and the NIH Infectious Disease Research Director, Dr. Anthony Fauci. This runs about two and a half hours. We're here today to discuss some alarming developments in the fight against HIV and AIDS in the United States. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recently announced that the HIV epidemic in the United States is growing at a rate far greater than was previously thought. The new figures are a stark reminder that the HIV epidemic is far from over and that we must take new and urgent steps to strengthen our national HIV prevention efforts. The first cases of what later came to be identified as AIDS were reported in Los Angeles in 1981. Over the next two years, the case reports accumulated and we learned that a distinct syndrome was being diagnosed in different populations all across the country. By the mid-1980s, there were an estimated 130,000 new infections every year in the United States. As infections increased, so did our investment in HIV prevention efforts. Even before the virus called HIV was identified as the cause of AIDS, CDC's experts had figured out the transmission routes and issued early recommendations for the prevention of infection. The federal government started investing significant amounts of funding in prevention and education efforts nationwide. These investments paid off and the infection rate dropped dramatically. But this is a job that is never done. This was recently demonstrated in dramatic fashion when CDC reported that the real infection rate is much higher than we thought. Over the past 10 years, CDC's official estimate for annual new infections have been about 40,000. But last month, CDC announced that in fact, there were over 56,000 new HIV infections in 2006. The higher figure was due to improved counting methods, not to an actual jump in infections, but it tells us that the epidemic in the United States is and has been growing faster than we had thought. The message these new findings send is clear. We're not doing enough to limit the spread of this deadly disease. What's more, we're still seeing severe disparities in HIV's impact on different populations. Men who have sex with men constitute 57 percent of new infections. Blacks who make up about 12 percent of the total population account for 45 percent of new HIV infections. Hispanics are also disproportionately affected. Part of the problem is that the federal government has not been doing enough for HIV prevention in the United States. In adjusted dollars, the CDC's HIV prevention budget has dropped more than 20 percent since 2002. This year, the administration actually asked for a million dollar decrease in HIV funds. This didn't make sense to me, so I asked the Centers for Disease Control to prepare a budget that reflects not what the White House wanted, but rather the agency's professional scientific judgment of what it would take to fully implement effective HIV prevention in the United States. As we will hear today, the administration asked for less than half of what CDC's scientific professionals estimate as necessary for effective HIV prevention. Instead of listening to its own experts, the administration requested that Congress fund HIV prevention programs at far lower levels. What's even more senseless is that by under, underfunding prevention, 
the nation will incur greater treatment costs down the road. It is indisputable that evidence-based HIV prevention saves money in addition to saving lives by avoiding the high costs of medical care and lost productivity. But on this issue, the administration apparently prefers to be penny-wise and pound-foolish. We are here today to learn from some of our nation's top HIV prevention experts what a truly robust national HIV prevention program would look like. We will hear from leaders at CDC and NIH about how they are attempting to roll out effective programs and research potential new ones. We will discuss barriers to evidence-based HIV prevention, like the Federal Needle Exchange Ban and this administration's stubborn and irrational focus on abstinence-only programs. And because HIV infections don't occur in a vacuum, we'll hear recommendations from all of our witnesses on how the, how the federal HIV prevention response should address societal factors that contribute to risk, including poverty, homelessness, racial and gender inequality, homophobia, and stigma related to HIV status. I look forward to a constructive discussions of these questions today, but one point should be clear from the outset. The status quo simply isn't acceptable. We undermine public health and betray some of America's most vulnerable citizens and allow the further spread of a deadly and still incurable disease by failing to invest in proven prevention methods. We aren't doing everything we can and should, and I hope this hearing will be the first step in returning the necessary spotlight, resources, and political will to HIV prevention efforts in the United States. Before recognizing our very distinguished panel of witnesses, I want to recognize uh, the gentleman uh, from Ohio, Mr. Turner, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing to examine how new data at the, on the incidence of HIV infection in the United States. Uh, we appreciate your longstanding dedication to public health issues and your abiding commitment to meet the many challenges posed by the AIDS epidemic. Using a more sensitive surveillance tool, the Centers for Disease Control found 56,300 new HIV infections in 2006. That is a 40 percent higher incidence than previous estimates. The upward adjustment does not reflect an acceleration of the epidemic, but a more precise capability to distinguish between recent and longer-term infections. So it still appears the epidemic has, in fact, plateaued in terms of new infections per year of the last decade, but at a markedly higher rate than we thought. With this new knowledge about the path and scope of the epidemic, epidemic. Public health officials can better target efforts to prevent the spread of the virus that causes AIDS. How to bring those prevention tools to at-risk groups has always been a challenge at every level. This more accurate data should inject a renewed sense of urgency into the Federal, State, local, and private sector partnerships working to stop the spread of HIV. But behind the figures lurks one deadly fact. No prevention strategy works on a person who doesn't know he or she is infected. At any given time, it is estimated fully 25 percent of Americans carrying HIV have not been diagnosed. They are far more likely to gauge in high-risk behaviors that expose still others to the silent infection. Breaking that silence, research has proven the power of information as a barrier against the virus. Once diagnosed, and properly counseled, HIV-infected individuals are significantly less likely to engage in behaviors that put others at risk. That leaves public health officials to confront the hard questions. Who should be offered testing? How often? And who pays for any broader HIV screening that might detect latent or unknown infections? HIV AIDS is not curable, but it is treatable. With the tools at our disposal, we need not consign thousands of our fellow citizens each year to the devastation of preventable HIV infection. Since its outbreak, the United States has played a leading role in research and treatment of HIV and AIDS. One of the witnesses today, Anthony Fauci, is a recognized leader in unlocking the lethal mechanisms by which the virus attacks the immune system. And this is an important hearing about the implications of this new CDC data for public health officials and public policymakers. So, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your attention to this issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Turner.
For our first panel, we are welcoming, uh, we're pleased to have Dr. Lou, uh, Julie Gerberding, uh, who has been the Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention since 2002. In this role, she has led the CDC in its mission of health promotion and disease prevention in the U.S. and abroad. Dr. Gerberding has contributed to more numerous peer-reviewed publications and textbook chapters into guidelines and policies on a range of health issues, including HIV prevention. She has served on federal and non-federal advisory councils, including the CDC's HIV Advisory Committee, and teaches infectious disease medicine at both Emory University and the University of California at San Francisco. And we want to welcome you back uh, to the committee, Dr. Gerberding, and we're pleased that you're here, coming right from Texas, where you've been trying to deal with the uh, the tragic consequences of the uh, hurricane. Dr. Gerberding is accompanied by Dr. Kevin Fenton, who since 2005 has served as the director of CDC's National Center for HIV AIDS, viral hepatitis, STD, and TB prevention. He leads the U.S. government's HIV surveillance and prevention efforts, interacting with state and local agencies, community organizations, and researchers nationwide. Uh, Dr. Fenton has worked in HIV research, epidemiology, and prevention since 1995, including as director of HIV and sexually transmitted infections department at the United Kingdom's Health Protection Agency. Uh, Dr. Anthony S. Fauci has served as the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the National Institute of Health since 1984. He oversees a broad range of research on the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of infectious diseases, including HIV AIDS. He continues to conduct his own research on immune-mediated and infectious disease and has contributed to over a thousand scientific publications. Dr. Fauci serves as one of the key advisors to the White House and the Department of Health and Human Services on AIDS issues and is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences Institute of Medicine. And uh, Dr. F uh, Fauci has testified on numerous occasions before this committee and other committees that I even chaired in the Congress uh, since the early 1980s, and we're happy to have you here as well. At the, uh, uh, and uh, Dr. Fauci is accompanied by Dr. Thomas Insel, the director of the National Institute for Mental Health at NIH. In that role, Dr. Insel oversees the agency's research on behavioral prevention methods for HIV. We're pleased that all of you are here today. It's the practice of this committee that all witnesses that testify before us do so under oath. So if you would please rise and raise your right hand. Do you um, solemnly swear that the testimony you'll give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will indicate each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, your uh, prepared statements will be in the record in full. We'd like to ask each of you to um, make your oral presentation uh, in around five minutes. We'll have a clock that will allow, allow you to see when the five minutes is up. It'll be green for four minutes, yellow for one minute, red when the five minutes is, has passed. And uh, we won't be strict on it, but we'd like that to be a guide so that when you see the red light, since we have many witnesses yet to come, we'd like to um, ask you to try to uh, reach your conclusion so that we can ask questions and hear from the other witnesses as well. Dr. Gerberding, we're pleased to have you. Thank you very much. I'd like to start with my first slide, which is a reflection on Ike striking in Galveston. I did visit the hurricane territory yesterday, and for the record, I would like to acknowledge the tremendous effort of the State Health Commissioner, Dr. Lakey, and a whole pantheon of experts in public health across the state that are performing miracles. But I think we all recognize that hurricanes represent urgent public health threats. And when people recognize an urgent threat, they hold no nothing back in responding to it. Unfortunately, on the next slide, we have another urgency, and that is the urgent reality of HIV AIDS in America. Last month, I spent two weeks at San Francisco General Hospital taking care of patients, and on my service, I had two undiagnosed AIDS patients die. I had several individuals come in with the opportunistic infections that we started seeing in 1981 when I was an intern. And in that community, we learned that there is an epicenter of HIV transmission among men who have sex with men, and particularly among African Americans. Similarly, I visited Oakland earlier this year and found, to my astonishment, an even grimmer situation in terms of HIV transmission in that community. On my next graphic, I've tried to represent the progress that we have made despite these current situations. 
Uh, we are currently uh, proposing federally a $24.1 billion HIV budget for all AIDS-related activities at the federal level. Of that, 4 percent is reflected in CDC's prevention budget. And I think over time we have had some good news. Um, we are definitely seeing people live longer with HIV and many are thriving despite the complications of the drug treatment and everything else that having a chronic illness represents. In addition, we've made tremendous progress in perinatal AIDS in reducing the incidence among injection drug users and among heterosexuals at high risk. Uh, we've also seen the rate of transmission decline over time. That means for every 100 HIV-infected individuals, the number of new people that they infect has continued to drop precipitously since the early phases of the epidemic. And finally, I think studies do show that prevention interventions can work. We have evidence of efficacy and at least 49 behavioral interventions and several others are on the docket for coming forward. Let me just quickly show you the pictures of what these statistics look like. The red line here is the number of people in America living with HIV. And the blue line are the number of new cases that were reported um, that precipitated this hearing. And you can see that although the number of people with HIV in our country continues to increase, the number of new infections is holding steady over the past uh, several years and declining as a large picture in the United States, meaning that our interventions are successful or we would see that blue line go up commensurate with the red line. On the next graphic, you can see the picture of perinatal transmission, again, evidence that prevention can work. On the next graphic, uh, the picture of what's happening recently among people at high-risk heterosexual contact, and I could repeat that for injection drug users and others. But on the next graphic, uh, we have the sobering statistic that is my uh, frame for the urgent reality that we're facing, and this is the incidence rates going up among men who have sex with men in the United States. On the next graphic, I showed some statistics that were released last week, which really reflect a detailed understanding of the epidemiology of this risk, showing that while overall the majority of men who have sex with men and get HIV infection are white, there's disproportionate representation of African Americans, and particularly young African Americans and Hispanic. They are uh, represented here way out of proportion to their prevalence in society. And on the next graphic, um, we have the rates of HIV infection which use as the denominator the number of people in our society in those categories. So you can see that African Americans have an infection rate that's about seven times that of whites and Hispanics have a rate that's about three times that of whites across America. So this is very serious information and it tells us where we need to target our prevention interventions. So let me conclude by telling you what I think are the priorities for those prevention interventions. We've submitted a long professional judgment. We've tried to put everything in there we could think of. We understand the reality of the budget, but we wanted you to know what the universe of possibility might be. <clears throat> so on the first slide, I've um, tried to summarize some of those interventions that relate to finding the leading edge of the epidemic. The information we just published is the first time we've ever been able to say in real terms, where is the infection now and how bad is it going and who's getting it? So we need to expand our ability to do that so that we have that information at the community level and can target those interventions that do work for those individuals. We also need to integrate services. It's great that we have representatives from mental health, substance abuse, and the broad continuum because there's a syndemic of these factors that come together in the concept of social justice and, and social determinants of health that we have to address if we're going to be successful here. And we need to conduct not just individual interventions but social marketing campaigns. On the next graphic, I'm emphasizing the importance of finding the people who are infected. This is epidemiology 101, but it's something that we still haven't been able to do successfully in this disease. 25 percent of infected people still don't know they have the virus. So we need to expand access to rapid testing, and in particular, our federal facilities need to move to support the CDC guidelines and allow screening for HIV using the protocols that we've recommended for the routine screening. We also need to have better tests and we need to focus those tests on finding people early, hopefully as they are seroconverting because that's the time when they pose the biggest transmission risk and we're missing them and they're highly infectious and they account for a disproportionate part of the epidemic. 
And on my last graphic, I've mentioned those aspects that relate to the need for new tools. We don't have all the answers here. I wish we did. We've been working on it, but our research budget hasn't really allowed us to update and modernize our toolkit. One area in particular, given the difficulties we're having with the vaccine, are the pre-exposure treatment trials to determine whether or not taking HIV drugs before you are exposed could result in an overall health benefit and a reduced risk of infection. CDC is conducting three of those studies and are collaborating on a fourth, and I know NIH is doing one too as well. So we're hoping that that could put a new biomedical toolkit, uh, a tool in our toolbox, while we're working on some of these other measures that we think are important. I just want to make one final point here. Um, the AIDS is a social disease as much as it is a viral disease. And part of bringing people to accept prevention is to create that expectation in an environment of hope. Many of the people who are getting this infection now are functioning in a society that offers them very little hope for education, economic, or social attainment. And if we don't address the underpinnings of the problem, we're never going to be able to get where we need to be as a nation. So thank you for allowing me to explode with a lot of information in a very short period of time, but we're very, very passionate about this and very committed to this issue. Thank you. Very helpful information. Dr. Fenton? Oh, you're just here to answer questions? That's okay. right. <laughs> well, we'll have questions for you. Dr. Fauci. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify before you here today on the role of the NIH research endeavor uh, in HIV prevention, the subject of this hearing. Uh, I guess the slides don't work, so we'll go with the, are they up? Okay. There they are. Okay. On the first uh, slide shown uh, on the board there, um, I want to just emphasize that since the very early days of HIV that you described in your opening statement in the summer of 1981, there have been some spectacular advances in AIDS research ranging from the initial discovery of the virus through the delineation of the pathogenesis, natural history, but importantly, treatment. Now, treatment has been one of the more spectacular successes in the development of now over 25 drugs that have transformed the lives of HIV-infected individuals. The results of this have been quite impressive. On the next slide is a review paper showing the results of the first decade of HIV written up in the Journal of Infectious Diseases that there is a conservative estimate of about 3 million lives, years of life have been saved in the United States alone from 1996 through 2005 on the basis of the accessibility of treatment, particularly the combinations of therapies. This has been repeated and verified in Europe, Australia, and Canada. Now, that's the very good news, but the subject of the hearing is what is still going on. So on the next slide, just to reiterate what Dr. Gerberdeen had said, we still have a major ongoing problem globally and even here in the United States with over a half a million deaths, 1.1 million people infected with HIV, and as underscored by Dr. Gerberdeen, 25 percent of them are unaware that they are infected. And we know the majority of infections come from an individual who does not know that he or she is infected, transmitted to another individual. And an example uh, is, is, is something that is very close to home. Uh, we make rounds three times a week at our clinic up at the clinical center at the NIH. And just last week, a patient was presented to me, a resident of the District of Columbia, 38 years old, who presented for the first time with advanced tuberculosis, central nervous system lymphoma, and a CD4 count of three which is about as low as you can get in a viral load. That person clearly was infected for many years, has now compromised his own ability to be treated because he's so advanced, and how, who knows how many people that that person exposed, mainly because he did not know that he was infected. Now, on the next slide, what about prevention? The NIH and its multiple institutes, particularly our institute, NIAID, NIMH, NIDA, Child Health, and others, have been heavily involved in prevention research. And when I say prevention research, is to try and get some of the scientific facts that would help inform some of the activities that are implemented so well by the CDC. On this slide, we show that if you include vaccine, behavioral change, and microbicides, about 38 percent of the NIH budget is devoted to prevention activities. And I just want to spend a minute to underscore some of the proven strategies 
as well as those that are still investigational and for which we have remaining challenges. On the next slide, proven HIV prevention strategies again underscores what Dr. Gerberty mentioned, that prevention does work when it's applied and implemented. For example, preventing sexually transmitted disease, cognitive behavior interventions, when applied, have shown to work. Behavioral changes regarding sexual transmission are paramount in its prevention. Condom promotion and a, and a study, a group of studies that were sponsored by the NIH just a year and a half ago in adult male circumcision in an international basis, predominantly in sub-Saharan Africa, showed anywhere from a 55 to a 65 percent prevention in males who were circumcised that lasted for three to four years of follow-up and likely much more. The prevention of bloodborne transmission, clearly needle exchange programs work. There's no doubt about that. Drug treatment programs, methadone and related programs have been shown in a number of studies by the CDC and by NIDA at the NIH to work. And probably the most dramatic success story is the prevention of mother to child transmission by treating the mother during pregnancy and the baby soon after delivery and most recent studies throughout weeks to months of breastfeeding have been truly a great success story. Next slide. There are also some investigational prevention strategies, some of which are in the process of being proven, others that are still challenging. The first is the prevention and treatment of co-infections such as tuberculosis, malaria, and other sexually transmitted diseases. Not all STDs or sexually transmitted diseases, when you treat them, result in a decrease in HIV transmission. But some do, and we're now continuing our studies to try and delineate that a little bit more clearly. We've been challenged by topical microbicide studies. The initial studies over the past several years have proven not to be effective. They were the first generation of studies that did not incorporate specific anti-HIV drugs. They were merely uh, chemicals that would block transmission, but not in a specific anti-HIV manner. The uh, products that are currently in the pipeline we're cautiously optimistic about. The last two I want to close on is antiretrovirals as prevention and vaccines. By an antiretroviral as prevention, we mean that if you treat people who are infected, you can theoretically and in reality decrease their ability to transmit to others. You can talk about population studies. If you treat enough people in a population, you'll get the mean viral load in the population low enough that you might decrease the incidence. But even more potentially exciting is what we call PrEP. And Dr. Gerberty mentioned that on one of his slides, or pre-exposure prophylaxis. There's a large study conducted by the CDC, several other studies, some of which are conducted by the NIH, looking at a large number of individuals to see if, in fact, this treatment prior to infection would significantly block transmission. And then there's vaccines, which in the history of viral diseases are generally the holy grail of how you stop the transmission of, a, uh, of a, uh, a, a viral infection. We have not been successful thus far. Next slide, as shown on this slide, um, at the last meeting this summer in Mexico City of the International AIDS Society, we discussed some of the remaining challenges and the reality that we will not have an HIV vaccine, at least for several years at best. I'm cautiously optimistic that we will. But up until the time that we do, we're going to be left with the prevention measures that were discussed by Dr. Gerberdine and myself and, and, and in your own uh, opening statement, Mr. Chairman. So on the last slide, I want to emphasize that point, that when we talk about prevention, it is not unidimensional and it's not one size fits all. We refer to it as a comprehensive prevention toolbox of which a vaccine would be a major contribution. But even if we get a vaccine that's effective, we would still have to rely very heavily on the other prevention measures that have been discussed in our various statements. So I'll close here, Mr. Chairman, and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Fauci. Dr. Insel, do you have a statement? Uh, no statement. Let's go on to the questions. Okay. I want to start off the questions uh, for you, Dr. Gerberding. I want to ask about CDC's HIV prevention goals and its budget. In January of 2001, and I understand this was before your tenure as director, CDC released a document called HIV Prevention Strategic Plan through 2005. At the time, the working estimate 
of annual new infections per year in the U.S. was 40,000. The agency called this number relatively stable but unacceptably high and stated that a new strategic plan for HIV prevention was essential. In this 2001 document, what was CDC's target for reducing annual new HIV infections? Um, I would um, want to let you know that although I was not uh, the CDC director during this period of time, I was on an advisory committee to the center before I went to CDC, so I participated in the earliest phases of that development. And the um, expectation optimistically at that time was a 50 percent reduction in the number of new infections to be able to drive the infection rate down to 20,000. Um, at that time, we didn't have a lot of evidence to model or base those figures on, but we believed that if we did everything we knew how to do, we could um, strive for that. It made sense to create a stretch goal, and obviously we didn't make it. All right, because if we look at 2005, fast forward uh, uh, five years later, CDC's estimate of annual new infections at that point was still 40,000 a year, uh, and, the, and the figure hadn't budged. Uh, why do you think that nothing changed? Uh, was it, uh, uh, what's your assessment? I, th I think it's complicated, but there are two factors that probably play a pretty big role. One is the fact that our earlier estimates were made before we recognized the benefits of drug treatment. And so what happened was we suddenly had a large, larger and larger and larger number of people in our country with HIV who presented a transmission risk to other people because they were surviving instead of dying from the disease. So it was a positive factor, but it clearly made our earlier estimates um, fairly irrelevant. The second thing is that I don't think we adequately controlled for the generational effect. So as new young people come into the risk environment, um, they don't behave, you know, kids are not little adults. They don't behave the way we would expect more um, mature people who've lived through their friends dying to behave. And so we saw increased infection rates as we're still seeing today among the youngest people. Um, so our estimates did not adequately adjust for the generational problem of new cohorts at risk. Well, when we look at the CDC budget in 2001, uh, there was a steady growth in the prevention part. And, and by that time, uh, in 2007, CDC's HIV prevention budget actually dropped in uh, adjusted dollars by 20 percent. So while we didn't see the decrease we had hoped for, we saw, in fact, uh, a steady level which would be the, a failure uh, of the prevention efforts to succeed. At that point, CDC put a, a document forward extending its HIV prevention through 2010. And what was the goal in that document, if you, if you can tell us? Um, I'd have to go back and, and review that particular estimate. Kevin, maybe you can answer that question. Sure. Thank you very much for that question. In the 2007 revision of the HIV prevention strategy, what we're attempting to do is to identify shorter term goals for HIV prevention as well as looking at goals which were achievable within the resources that we had at CDC. One of the experiences we had from 2001 to 2007, as you mentioned, was the fact that our budget remained relatively flat over that time. So it was crucially important that we looked at what was achievable in the next three years. And, and the, the number meantime, that you found that was it, you thought was achievable was rather than 50 percent down to 10 percent, is that that's right? That's correct. And was that uh, 10 percent goal modeled on the fact that you uh, saw a decrease in the prevention side of the uh, HIV budget? It was modeled on the realities of mm -hmm. the existing prevention budget as well as the availability of better information, better surveillance information, better data on incidents which we knew were forthcoming in the next few years. And how much did the administration request for HIV, pre HIV prevention for this next uh, fiscal year 2009? But the request um, in the proposed budget is uh, less than the request from last year by a, a percent or so. So it is a, a reduction. And as I understand, that's $752.6 million. I believe that's correct. Now, in, in according to the, your professional judgment budget, uh, the funding that CDC needs to conduct appropriately scaled up domestic HIV prevention programs and research for 2009 I understand is $1.63 billion, is that right? 
If we were able to walk out the door today and do absolutely everything that we knew how to do to full scale, it would be expensive. And those numbers reflect that kind of um, best case scenario. I think we also recognize we couldn't go from where we are to where we would like to be as fast as we probably reflected in our pr budget estimates. But we wanted to give you the flavor that right. the scale here is one challenge. Uh, the what to do is the other challenge. Well, and if just to look at where we are and where you, you would like us to be and where you think the money could wisely be spent, the administration is proposing half of what CDC's experts say is necessary. And in fact, that's an actual, actual decrease of a million dollars from fiscal year 2008. So um, the proportion, it appears to us, for domestic HIV funding for prevention would be around 5%. Yeah, I, I think the um, the figures for the large request for domestic HIV, the $24.1 billion overall that's been requested, includes about a 4 percent prevention budget, um, at least according to analysis that we've been able to review from Kaiser. So it's a very small piece of the overall budget. And I think the concept of a dime of prevention is worth a dollar of cure is what we need to relook at, especially now that we have these new incidence data. In addition, we know that um, it is cost saving to prevent HIV because it's so expensive to well, treat. You're telling it. us that information. Did you tell the President? Did you tell the Secretary of HHS? Did anyone in the administration ever come and ask you over the last six years what you and your expert colleagues believed and what you would need in order to turn the domestic epidemic around? We've had a lot of briefings on this subject, and I think one of the challenges that I've faced uh, at CDC is my own expert judgment that it isn't going to be enough to just do more of the same. We've got to really step back and say, you know what, you keep doing the same thing over and over again, it doesn't matter how big you do it, you're not really going to solve the problem. So not only do we need to expand what we know can work, we've got to find new things. And so I, I really want to emphasize that the research for new tools is also a very, very big part of this, and I'm sure Dr. Fauci would agree with that, that there's more we need to know and not just more we need to do. Well, just to conclude my uh, questioning here, you can't do more of the same with less money, even if some of the same things you were doing were well, successful. unless you're a magician. <laughs> and if you could get new tools, that would be great. But uh, you may not be able to even do the new tools if your prevention budget is decreasing but what I, and the population yeah. of people being infected is even more than we expected what, to be. What I'm really place. also, and what I've asked Dr. Fenton to do is to look at whatever the pie is, whatever the investment that we have, and make absolutely sure that whatever we're doing with it, we're getting the absolute maximum out of it that we can. We may need to rebalance. We would like to have more, but we may need to also rebalance what we are doing to be sure that it's making the biggest difference. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Davis. Of course, Congress appropriates the money, not the administration. So this Congress has the authority to move those numbers up or down uh, appropriately, don't they? That's correct. Okay. And uh, are we spending more internationally on AIDS prevention and uh, treatment than we are nationally now? We are spending more internationally for the President's emergency program as well as the Global Fund. So basically we have seen more funding for AIDS and HIV prevention and treatment, but it has gone internationally instead of nationally. May I just qualify that for, for sure, please, a, a, a statement? Because as I said, our total Federal budget for HIV is 24 some billion dollars a year because of the uh, mass investment that we make in treatment nationally. So we are not spending 24 billion internationally a year. Okay. Now, a, a full 25 percent of individuals with HIV, uh, I think, you are unaware of their infection, and these individuals account for about 50 percent of new infections? It is about, um, it is probably at close to 50 percent. We know that once people find out, well, I think it is actually 68 percent. The, the undiagnosed people are accounting for about 60 percent of the infections that we, yeah. that we um, are seeing. But we are also learning more recently that probably early infection is a special subset of that group. And so people who are j newly infected, don't recognize it, aren't getting tested as they develop the symptoms of the conversion illness 
are highly infectious with great How virus. How long does it take after contact to that you're infected and can pass it on? Is it just a matter of is it a matter of hours, it, days? It, it's not hours, but it happens faster um, than we realize now that we have more and more sensitive tests. So although the antibody tests may not become positive for many days, the virus is replicating very early on after exposure, and that's why people can transmit even though they don't know they have it. Yeah. I recently spent a, uh, about 10 days in Africa touring some of our facilities over there on AIDS prevention. One of the problems there is, I mean, the people that have it now are, and are getting medical care, they are keeping uh, mothers from passing it to their kids, they are able to live semi-normal lives. Uh, but over there, the men are just not as likely to go in and turn themselves in, and there is still, still a lot of denial uh, in Africa. Is, is there anything similar in the United States where there are many um, comparable social issues. Um, one of them is shame. People are ashamed to have the infection. The other is stigma. They are punished if someone else finds out they have it. And then the third is ignorance. There are still many people in this country and around the world who don't recognize the risk and don't understand that their behavior puts them at risk. Now, I understand that 38 percent of the individuals, uh, roughly, with newly diagnosed HIV are now developing full-blown AIDS within a year of diagnosis. Um, for these individuals, prevention, testing, and treatment strategies don't, don't seem to have worked. Um, what do you see? Is, this, is there a granular understanding of this population and what leads to this outcome of people who are, are being diagnosed and then moving quickly to AIDS? Well, the HIV diagnosis is happening perhaps years after the infection has occurred at the time people are beginning to develop symptoms. So it's a failure to diagnose, a failure to reach out and get yourself tested, or a failure for health professionals or people you encounter so that's in the community. A, a diagnosis settings. question. They've waited yeah, so long. D, the diagnosis of the prevention paradigm has got to be a strong emphasis. Okay. Now, as the epidemic has progressed, the perception of HIV-AIDS has changed. Uh, the success of effective treatments may have the downside of creating a sense of complacency, actually, about HIV-AIDS impact. Uh, what, what are the Federal efforts that are underway in order to address complacency and correct some of these misconceptions? Anything we can do uh, from our perspective? We need to do so much more than we are doing right now. We need to get AIDS back on the radar screen. Um, we need to highlight the fact that this isn't just something that happens underground. This is something that is still posing a threat to college students and to young men and women across our nation's fabric. We need to engage community leaders. We need to engage popular opinion leaders. Uh, we need to make it clear that it's not a problem over there. It's a problem at home. And all you have to do is look at the statistics in the metropolitan D.C. area to see a picture that would suggest we have nothing to be complacent about. The, uh, it's remarkable the medical progress that has been made in this area over the last 10 years. I was, I was very surprised. I mean, people with who were diagnosed now, it's no longer a death sentence. If you take your medication regularly, uh, we're being able to stop it from being passed on to kids uh, and the like. I mean, getting treatment now, uh, if, if, if you're if you're HIV positive, going and getting treatment is literally a lifesaver, isn't it? Treatment is life-saving, and this is hard to say, but as much as we want people with HIV infection to live and thrive and survive, it's not good to have HIV. No. Um, these drugs are hard to take. They are wrought with complications and side effects. It's not easy to have HIV and take these drug and treatments for a lifetime. And it's expensive, and it isn't a disease that anyone should want to have, and it's certainly not a disease that we should accept as just part of our, you know, uh, advanced society. We let, still let need to prevent this disease. For the uninsured who are diagnosed HIV positive, obviously uh, having to take the medication is, what, $1,000 a month? What, what would it be? What would it, it depends very much on which regimen okay. you're taking, and there fortunately now so many good choices that um, there are a variety of, of options and a variety of cost factors, um, but it is not inexpensive. It is one of the most expensive chronic diseases to treat and manage. Okay. I think that's my question. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you all for your testimony here. Um, you have testified about the importance of implementing evidence-based uh, prevention programs, so I want to ask a few questions 
targeted on the evidence behind some of our policies that affect the prevention programming. The new CDC incidence numbers show that injection drug use directly accounts to about 12 percent of the new infections. The sexual partners, the children of injection drug users are also indirectly at risk. There is scientific consensus that needle exchange programs reduce the transmission of HIV and other infectious diseases without increasing the rate of drug use. Needle exchange programs also connect people to important health and social services, including drug treatment. These are the conclusions that have been reached, as far as I understand it, on, based on evidence of at least 18 groups of experts in the most prominent professional and public health societies in the world, including the CDC and NIH. Just recently, when the CDC published its uh, August data, the authors noted that infections among injection drug users dropped 80 percent. And they stated that, among other factors, one reason was that drug users, and I quote, have reduced needle sharing by using sterile syringes available through needle exchange programs or pharmacies. So despite this overwhelming mountain of evidence, every year the Labor HHS Department Appropriations Bill includes a provision banning the use of Federal funds for needle exchange programs. So it looks like other programs around the country and communities and states are, are doing all that they can do, private people, uh, but they are not really being supported by the Federal Government. So, Dr. Fauci, let me start with you, if I could. In your professional scientific judgment, does the public health evidence support the Federal ban on funding needle exchange programs? Uh, <clears throat> no, it doesn't, actually. I was part of a, uh, a group that I helped co-chair years and years ago to look in a somewhat meta-analysis way of all the data that you referred to, asking the two questions, A, does needle exchange help promote illicit drug use, and B, does it impede or in block, in many respects, the transmission of HIV? And the answer to both of those questions were it doesn't increase injection drug use and it does prevent HIV infection. So the scientific data are really rather firm and totally convincing that injection drug use and the transmission of HIV through injection drug use can be uh, decreased significantly by needle exchange programs. Thank you. And Dr. Gerberding and Dr. Fenton, in your professional scientific judgment, uh, do you agree with Dr. Fauci? Well, I, I agree, and I also ran a bridge program to a needle exchange in San Francisco from San Francisco General Hospital, so I had a chance to see firsthand. I want to emphasize the word you use, though, program, because it isn't just the needle. It's the surround, the education, the reduction in partners and sharing and so forth. So it has to be done in the context of, of the overall program. Um, and I, un, my understanding is that there is actually for CDC a congressional prohibition on using any of our appropriated dollars from, uh, for, for needle exchange. So we, we need to work with the that Congress the on this. That was the dilemma that I was pointing out. And Dr. Fenton, do you also agree? I concur. Thank you. So let me move on now and ask a question about programs for youth. Uh, the new CDC data shows that almost a third of the new infections occur with people under the age of 30. There has been a number of comprehensive sex education programs that appear to show a reduction in HIV or HIV risk behaviors among young people. But aside from a small amount of money in CDC's uh, Department of Adolescent and School Health, there doesn't appear to be any Federal funds dedicated to comprehensive sex education. In the meantime, we spend about a billion and a half dollars on abstinence only until marriage programs. I am aware of no evidence that this kind of narrow program decreases HIV risk. In fact, a longitudinal, independent, congressionally mandated study that came out last year found that the programs had no impact at all on teen behavior compared to the control group. In April, we heard from the American Public Health Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics and others that these programs are not supported by evidence. So I want to ask each of you individually, in your professional scientific judgment, do you believe that evidence at this time supports abstinence only until marriage programs as an effective intervention to reduce HIV risk among youth? Dr. Gerberding? Um, let me say that I have spent a great deal of time in preparation for this hearing reviewing those data, and I agree with the conclusions that there is no evidence of benefit from the 10 abstinence only programs that have been evaluated. Um, and in looking at the comprehensive curricular programs, there is more evidence of benefit, at least in terms of risk behavior and knowledge, and hopefully um, STDs in the long term, although we have never studied an impact on HIV. But I, I want to also emphasize that there are 
many in the STD world of science who believe that delaying the on a trait to sexual behavior is a good and very important part of a comprehensive program. So abstinence is not a dirty word, but programs that deal with youth sexual health need to bring to them the entire compendium of tools that we know they may need in their efforts to protect themselves. Dr. Feder. I agree with the statement of Dr. Garberding. I know of no evidence supporting the effectiveness of abstinence only until marriage programs in preventing STDs or HIV incidents among young people. And I also support and concur with Dr. Garberding's statement regarding the role of comprehensive sex education programs as an effective tool or as part of an effective program towards better sexual health among our youth. Dr. Fauci. Yes, I, I agree also. It's pretty clear that uh, if you look at abstinence only in a vacuum, that there's no data to indicate that that decreases transmission of HIV or other sexually transmitted diseases. But again, to underscore what Dr. Gerberdine says, as a part of a comprehensive program where you try to delay the sexual debut, but you also inform people of what you need to do if you do not practice abstinence, has to go along with that. Otherwise, alone in a vacuum, it doesn't work. Sure. Let me, if I can, Mr. <laughs> just conclude by asking, has Health and Human Services ever asked any of you for your opinion on these two subjects? We've had many briefings on this subject and I would say that as the data have come forward, it's only been recently that we've actually had evaluation studies pulled together to really um, ask the question. From a CDC standpoint, our total investment in abstinence every year is about $2.2 .2 million. And I actually wish, you know, 15 years ago we'd made a much bigger investment because we would know the answers to the questions that we're finally now being able to surface. So we um, erred perhaps in retrospect in not going into this with an open mind and doing those kinds of programmatic, innovative evaluation programs in the first place. I'd be comforted if the uh, budget reflected the error and changed around and, and moved some of that money to a more effective place, but we're going to have to fight for that one, I think. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chase. Thank you. A number of years ago, I chaired the uh, committee that oversaw HHS, and uh, uh, we had Donna Shalala come before us because um, HHS had failed for a year to get the committee together that was to begin to describe how we and determine how we could protect the blood supply. Uh, we had 25,000 hemophiliacs who died. And I never saw it as my purpose to go after the Clinton administration, nor do I think it's my purpose here to go after the Bush administration. But I'm, I'm really puzzled that this is, would in any way be a political issue. Uh, I'd like to know from uh, both our, our key witnesses, uh, have you found in any way that the administration has been unresponsive in trying to deal with this age, AIDS epidemic? I would like to um, say that my intersection with both secretaries that I've worked for as individuals as well as staff from the White House that I've encountered on the issue of domestic and international AIDS has come to me to ask for science. They've come to me to ask for the data. Um, I don't personally feel that I've come under any pressure to comply with a particular policy. Um, but I also them, Have you found them unresponsive? No. I haven't. I, that Dr. has not Fossey. been my experience, but Dr. Fossey, have you found them un unresponsive? No, I'm not. I've, I've, they, they've, they've listened. Um, several administrations, the, the current administration, the Clinton administration, and the. I mean, it seems like it's the one area where politics has kind of right. not been part of it. So I'd hate to introduce it now. We have um, what 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 you have basically said to us is the upward adjustment does not reflect an acceleration of the epidemic but a more precise capability to distinguish between recent and long-term infections. So isn't it clear that we have new information and with this new information we need to respond to it? Dr. Fossey? Yes, as, as we get new information we certainly do need to respond to it and that is the reason for the intensification. Uh, and isn't, isn't this new information that we're learning? I mean we're learning that it, well, the epidemic hasn't gone up, it's just that our statistics were not as accurate as they could be, correct? Yes, uh, as Dr. Gerberdine has mentioned, and I'll obviously leave for her to, to comment on that, the, the new, more sophisticated and accurate counting measures indicate that the incidence or number of new infections per year is higher than we had thought it was, but it has been stable since the 90s. So it, it has not gone up. It's just higher numbers because of better counting. 
co the um, new information is based primarily on uh, new testing um, activities in the states as well as new tests. Um, what it tells us is that there's no room for complacency. 55,600 no, people absolutely. is a lot of but, people. But this, six, no, I, there is absolutely no room for complacency. The issue is that we have new information, and from this new information, we better act on it, correct? Th that's yeah. exactly why. Now, now, do either of you appear before the appropriation? Uh, Shay, sure. Uh, feel forgive me. I know it's your five minutes, but it seems to me you haven't let a witness complete a sentence yet. And I know you only have a limited time, but I'd be glad to yield sure, you a couple sure. no, of I, 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 I'm sorry, I just have a number of questions, but I'm de delighted to have you continue. Um, I, I think the, the important message here is that we need to be able to have this kind of information at the community level because it tells us right where we need to go. This data tells us nationally we need to go to men who have sex with men, African Americans and Hispanic people and do a lot more than we're doing right now in those targeted populations. But in communities there will be even more um, specific information that can tell us how to use the resources we have to get the most benefit from it. So you're absolutely right. This new information has to, t it tells me that we need to reframe what we're doing and I've asked Dr. Fenton to bring in experts and really look at our portfolio as it exists in light of this new information and say where are we and where should we be? Okay. You no, know, I mean, and I, and I congratulate the, the, both the chairman and ranking member because I know they work together in having this hearing. This is a huge uh, piece of information that really isn't political information. It's new knowledge based on new science and we need to respond to it. I'd like to make sure uh, do you either, any of the four of you uh, make presentations before uh, Congress on, on funding requests? Yes, we defend the budget every year at our appropriations right. hearing in front of the House and the Senate. Right. And, and you're never uh, required to say something that's not true before those hearings, correct? C correct. Okay. So in other words, if, if, if a committee member asks you a question, about your funding needs, you would be very candid with them. Is that not correct? Yes. Is that correct? It's correct. Yeah. So uh, if, if, if someone on the committee said, is this enough money to do your job, and you said you didn't think it was, you would tell them, well, we think we need more, and if we had more, we would put it to this use. Is that correct? Well, Mr. Shays, there <clears throat> is a, a reality as an agency head, and I know Dr. Fauci feels this as an institute head. We can always think of good ways to spend money to do more than we're doing, um, but we also have to respond to the realities of the budget proposals that are put in front well, of us. But, but when you ask me for my professional judgment, I give you my very best answer unconstrained by any other realities. So any member on that committee who says, uh, do you need more money in these areas and how you would use it? You would let them know and if I you... I tell the truth. Thank you. Thank you very M much. Mr. Chair, if I may, as an appropriator on that committee. Sure. Um, I think what Dr. Gertebrain said was honest, but I think it honestly needs to be said that she comes in and she does her job with the utmost professional. She's very, very honest as everyone is from CDC, NIH, but they all defend they all defend the President's priorities and the President's choices. Right. And, and, uh, and then you as a, as a member of the committee feel very inclined to ask very candid questions and I, I know that based on the testimony that they would give you a candid response in return. And then if we do anything it's called an earmark by the President. So uh, I'll just conclude by saying in the end this was a budget agreed to by a Democratic Congress suggested by a Republican president. It's a bipartisan budget and in the end um, we have to work together to come up with the best conclusions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, the chair would like to uh, recognize himself for an additional mi minute, uh, hearing no objection. Uh, Dr. Fauci and, and Dr. Gerberding, as I understand it, when you come before the Congress, you are defending the budget submitted by the administration. Isn't that correct? Correct. Correct. Now, unless you're asked what your professional judgment might be, you're there to represent the administration. Uh, Dr. Gerberding, when I asked you questions uh, earlier, you indicated that you thought that you should have had more money in the prevention efforts going all the way back uh, to the beginning of your time. And I asked you about uh, whether you heard from people in the administration, President, Secretary, and others, uh, and whether they asked you what you really needed. You said you had lots of meetings held with 
superiors to discuss these needs. I'd like to ask you for the record to submit uh, documents and any other further information about the meetings you had to tell them uh, what you thought you needed to uh, prevent the uh, epidemic from increasing in, uh, in I'll, scope. I'll, I'll do my best to resurrect that. I, I must also say that um, HIV isn't the only place that we've gone would, to would, say would, we're would concerned the, about. Would the gentleman yield for a slight inter intervention? Sure. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure for the record, was this new data available, and I don't know what the answer is, but was this new data that's available today available when the President and Congress were presenting their la doing their last budget. The new data um, were published in August um, at the uh, at the um, beginning of August of this, this year. This year, mm -hmm. so it was not available either to the president or to Congress. That's correct. Thank you. And you're uh, developing your your CDC budget. Do you start from scratch from what you believe is needed, or do you receive a uh, preset total from HHS or the Office of Management and Budget into which you must fit your goals? I think at, like every agency, we're given some parameters. They vary from year to year. When I started, we were given parameters for increases. Recently, we've been given parameters to have scenarios for a, a modest increase, a flat line, or a reduction. And we go forward with different versions of our request based on what parameters are finally selected by the administration to present the final budget to Congress. I also present our request to the formal budget council in the department, and that is a factor that the secretary weighs when he looks at all of the agency budgets um, in aggregate, because he has to finally bring the budget forward. And when all is said and done, your budget now for uh, domestic HIV prevention is around 5 percent, and that's a drop in uh, the percentage you've had in previous years. Isn't that correct? Um, I'm not sure the 5 percent figure, but because most of our domestic HIV money is for prevention, but the amount of money that our government is spending on prevention is, is still hovering at about 4 percent of the total. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ms. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had the opportunity recently to spend some time at Gilead, which is a company in my district, and I'm going to preface my questions based on that fact because they provided me with information that I thought was pretty astonishing. Um, one is that of the 50,000 new HIV um, individuals in America, the vast percentage of them are African American women. Now that seems to be different from what you provided today. But their concern to me was that African American women are the highest increase in those contracting HIV. Is that not the case? No, that's incorrect. The majority of new HIV infections are occurring among men, and the majority of those are among men who have sex with men. So the women then, the African American women are an increasing number? What you may have heard is that the largest proportion of women who are newly infected with HIV are African American women. So they account for nearly a substantial proportion, more than half or just about half of the new infections which are occurring in women in the United States. And then you have smaller proportions of infections which are occurring among Hispanics and white women. So that may have been the statistic that they were referring to. What was most amazing to me was that the regime now for um, drugs has been reduced, at least with Gilead's um, work, to one pill a day as opposed to nine or ten pills in which Patients oftentimes will not take one of the pills because it is um, upsetting physically to them. And by being able to just take one pill, you're getting greater compliance. Um, what they impressed upon me was the importance of testing. Because as um, I think one of my colleagues earlier said, it's not a death sentence anymore. In fact, being diagnosed with HIV um, means that you can, in fact, have a full life, a full life expectancy. It's just being tested early, being diagnosed early, and getting the drugs and following the regime that's, that's offered. Is that not the case? That, that is the case. And just the one pill has many drugs in it, but they Correct. were able to combine them into a single tablet. Correct. So listening to them and listening to you, it seems to me that we need to do two things. One is 
augment the testing that goes on in this country everywhere. Um, two, we require all other countries to come up with national HIV AIDS plans if they are participating in PEPFAR, but we don't have a national plan. Is that true? We have a national strategy and we're committed to updating it in light of the new incidence information that we're receiving. We also in, I think, December, Kevin, will be publishing a, 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 a new update on interventions that work that we can incorporate into the national strategy. So testing, what do we do to augment testing in this country? There are some things we're doing right now. One of the biggest advances is the rapid test that allows people to be tested in non-medical environments. Um, we are really pushing hard to ha make testing a routine part of medical care so that when you come in, you get tested. And I was so pleased to see this in action at San Francisco General. It's com night and day compared to even five years ago. Um, but that's not happening everywhere, and it's particularly not happening in VA hospitals and federal facilities yet because they have um, regulations that have to be changed in order for that to happen. But we need to make testing universally accepted and acceptable in all kinds of non-traditional environments. Would it make sense for us to um, make Medicaid funding contingent on participating in a program where testing is done uniformly? Well, I'd like to see um, us work with CMS around um, support for screening because ultimately screening will be cost effective for CMS and HRSA and the other um, federally funded health programs. So I think that's an important lever that we want to pull and we are working on how to get those regs changed. Finally, on, in terms of microbicides, um, that was heralded some years ago as being uh, an outstanding opportunity for us to address the issue, particularly in. Um, places around the world, Africa in particular. It appears in your testimony that I just read that um, there has been some disappointing results in the clinical trials. Could you expand on that, please, yeah, the, and tell us where you are going with microbicides? The, the clinical trials so far with the available compounds have been disappointing. They have failed to protect and in some cases may have actually enhanced transmission because of irritation in the mucosal tissues in contact with the microbicide. But that doesn't mean that we won't find compounds that work. And there are studies ongoing right now in animal models and early clinical studies looking at both vaginal as well as rectal microbicides. So this is a very important aspect area for investment is one of those new tools that I'm trying to make a plea for um, working collaboratively with NIH, of course, as well as FDA. And most of those studies, uh, Ms. Spear, were done with microbicides that don't have a specific anti-HIV drug in it. Uh, the second generations are those that are now incorporating drugs that specifically block the virus. So the issue that Dr. Gerberdine mentioned is one we still haven't overcome is the propensity towards vaginal irritation, which can sometimes paradoxically make things worse, but also there has not been potent anti-HIV drugs in the compounds, which are now the second and third generations one that we feel a little bit more optimistic about now are ones that do contain those compounds. And my last question, Mr. Chairman, to both of you, if you were being asked today how much money we should be spending in the United States on HIV and AIDS, how much would that budget be? Um, we have submitted that for the record, our professional judgment um, without constraint. Um, and as Kevin and I sat down and walked through that budget, um, I think we recognize that this isn't just a CDC question. It has to include the NIH. It has to include SAMHSA for mental health because we can't solve this problem without doing more for mental health and substance use. And we need to address the correctional facilities because a disproportionate part of the population at risk is in correctional environments. So we only have a piece and we probably need to sit down together um, as a collaboration and really think through a true national standard strategy, and that's what we're proposing to do as these new data become available. Well, give us a number nonetheless. I don't <laughs> I, I can give you an NIH number. Um, our budget, as you know, has been essentially flat for the last four or five years. So we, we have 29 plus billion dollars in research that we've that we spend, which is a, is a substantial amount of money. The difficulty is if you have no increases for several years in a row, you are really looking at a 3.2 percent decrease per year in actual uh, real money in the sense of uh, inflationary index. So you are looking at a 
minus 12, 13 or plus percent decrease over a period of five years. So when people ask us in our professional judgment, which I'll give you now, that if you're looking at what we could use and spend quite well, the NIH budget is 2.9 billion for AIDS on a budget that's 29 billion for all of NIH, so it's a little bit more than 10 percent. Uh, so with a $2.9 billion budget for the NIH for AIDS, we could well spend about $3.35 billion. And Thank you, Ms. Spear. Your, your time has expired. Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, people are dying every day in this country because of AIDS, and the numbers continue to increase despite the fact that AIDS prevention works. And I know this all too well because I recently lost a friend from AIDS. It was a story that could go with maybe not being tested quick enough. It's a story that you could talk about fear and discrimination, but it also includes the federal government and the state of Minnesota not doing what it could do to support people who are on antiretroviral treatment. And the stress that these individuals go through when their treatment is threatened or cut off and then they find themselves scrambling for treatment. We're here today because we need to get our energy back into the need for HIV prevention and education efforts. And I appreciate sincerely the testimony of the panel. We know that there are populations now that are more at risk than other populations. We're here today because the CDC's report found out that there are 60, excuse me, 56,000 new HIV infections last year focused in racial and ethnic minorities. That's 70 percent new cases. This is also true of Minnesota, and I wish Mr. Shays was still here. Maybe he'll come back. Minnesota has recorded the highest number of HIV cases seen in the last 10 years in 2007, with 325 new cases. Gay, bisexual men are the highest group impacted with 77 percent of all cases. Minnesota is also facing higher increases among young men and uh, young, among Latino women. We know that the HIV rate in African American men in the immigrant population is 20 times higher than the statewide average. Mr. Chair, I would I'll submit some issues for the records, but one thing that was brought up in a question was, well, this is new because we're testing better. Well, Minnesota's been testing since 1985, so it's going up in Minnesota. I'm, I, 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 I want to uh, ask you again, do you think the only reason why you're seeing uh, rates increase in the populations that I have mentioned and across this country, the only reason? is because testing is more effective, knowing that states submit records to you on a regular basis. Um, I regret if I implied that we thought the reason for the number that this was related to testing. Um, this number is a new number because we have a new diagnostic test that allows us to tell when somebody was infected so we can distinguish very old infections from recent infections. So that's the test element of the number. Um, but the number that we're reporting today and the back calculations that we did using this new methodology of extrapolation over time um, allows us to recognize that we've been misunderstanding uh, the true incidents for a long period of time. In part, it's, it's complicated, and I'd be happy to sit down and walk through some of the science of it, but it's not that we're doing more testing, and you're right, Minnesota was one of the first to have HIV uh, reporting and the first to take a, 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 an aggressive um, perspective on that. Um, but nevertheless, even in Minnesota, there are undiagnosed people and there's ongoing transmission. Thank you. Um, one of the people who took it, took it to the street, took it to public officials was a uh, a wonderful person, our state epidemiologist, uh, Dr. Michael Osterholm, who made sure that we kept track of, of records and that. Some people called him an alarmist for going out and talking about it at the time. And I think the alarm needs to go off again, and so I thank you again for your report. Mr. Chairman, the Minnesota Department of Health's federal CDC HIV prevention grant has been reduced 
by 8 percent the past five years. Federal CDC STD prevention grants, which is also a precursor that's, that's been used, uh, has been reduced 4 percent since uh, 2003. That's despite the number of STD cases has risen 14 percent since 2003. Mr. Chair, I'm going to submit some information uh, into the record uh, from, from the State of Minnesota and the profile of HIV epidemic. Um, I, I will be around if there's a, a, an opportunity for, for more questions. I originally wasn't going to spend my time so much talking about Minnesota, but I wanted to, for the public, clear up any misunderstanding that might have been what these statistics are really indicating to us, and that's to wake up and to start getting correct information and to let today's youth know that treatment is not a cure. Thank it you. is not a cure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Thank you very much, Ms. McCollum. We'll be, uh, without objection, we'll be pleased to receive the information for the record that you would like to submit. Uh, Ms. Uh, Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to clarify something that was said, uh, and I'll direct this toward you, Dr. Fenton. As I understood, HIV is spreading more quickly among African American women than any other group. Is that correct or not correct? HIV infection is spreading at the greatest rate among gay and bisexual men. In fact, our data shows that they're the only group where we've seen consistent and sustained increases in HIV incidence since the early 1990s. Then uh, let me go back because uh, after the virus was spread, I mean identified mm -hmm. around 1980, 81, uh, it was believed to be among uh, white males having sex with males. Mm -hmm. It seemed that uh, there was attention given to that segment of society and things improved, and that's where the funding was going. Uh, maybe 10 years later, there was data showing that it was moving quicker among African American women coming from partners who injected themselves. Uh, as I understand that uh, there is a disproportionate toll on African Americans, male, females, mm -hmm. at this time and they account for 12 percent of the population, but 45 percent of the new infections in the year 2006. Is that true? That's true. Okay. I might have missed this part of your testimony, so let me just uh, refer back to it. But uh, can you tell us more about what CDC is doing in terms of the heightened national response to address HIV and AIDS in the African American community? Thank you. Please. I'd be delighted to tell you about that. The Height National Response is an initiative which was started in 2006, and it brings together CDC, our federal partners, and our partners and leaders in the African American community to focus on the epidemic among African Americans and to accelerate our prevention efforts. And the Height National Response is built on four key pillars. The first is to expand HIV testing within the African American community. The second is to expand the reach of our prevention services. In other words, to scale up effective prevention interventions with African Americans so we know it will have an impact on the epidemic. The third is to mobilize the African American community. And we've been really working with a range of amazing African American leaders to focus and to bring the conversation back to HIV and the importance of community leadership on HIV AIDS. And the fourth pillar is on research to ensure that we're investing in research for and by African Americans so that we're looking at culturally competent prevention interventions moving forward. Now, did the main points that you are describing to us, did you get new funding to be able to implement? No, this is a, a, a great example of what Dr. Gerberding said of looking at our existing prevention portfolio and having to make tough decisions to realign our existing prevention dollars into what we believe are urgent threats or urgent realities and to deal with the, the matters at hand. And so this is part of the activities that we have to do in the current environment. Well, going back and looking at the history because um, I chaired the Health and Human Services in California Senate for 17 years. I was there 
when we identified the virus. And I was there when money flowed in to address white males having sex with white males. I was there too when uh, we discovered that it was moving among the African American uh, female community. And I never saw the funding keep pace with the spread. So uh, I will expect uh, in trying to reach your goals to reduce the rate of infection that you have not been able to reach those goals of reducing the rate of infection among that population. Well, actually, we do know that the transmission rate of HIV has been declining in the United States. There are more people living with HIV, but as you but saw- But what about African? I really want to zero in, because this was a grave concern. I carried the needle exchange program for years. I was called on the carpet by particularly the ministerial community. I had to go to San Francisco and sit in the hot seat. And it was very, very difficult to have an understanding that if we do a needle exchange, at least we take a dirty needle out. And at that time, as Dr. Gerberding has said, that we're able then to uh, give information about treatment and at the point of exchange. And uh, that program only was adopted after Willie Brown took over and carried. I was gone at that point. But I'm still concerned as to what is happening in that community. And I'm still concerned about resources. And uh, I would like to know the status of mobilizing the community. I know we're working through a lot of our churches now. Can you just add to that, please? Sure. We, it's been an amazing couple of years in which we've brought leaders from all walks of life from the African American community to dialogue with us and to plan with us. Leaders from the African American faith communities, from the academic sector, from the business sector, from uh, grassroots organizations who have come to Atlanta to talk about their activities and their plans and to look at ways in which CDC can um, accelerate efforts towards prevention. This has been a, a new way for us to work as an agency. It's an important way for yes. us to work as an agency moving forward. Uh, and Thank I'll you, just end with this, yeah. if I might take just another minute, Chairman. Without objection, gentlelady, yield okay. another minute. Uh, the African, in the African American community, our churches are the place where people come together. And uh, that is a route that I think should be more focused on and if we had the necessary budget items, and this is something I have in mind, to uh, impact those who are appropriators, we really need to just, and I understand also that uh, HIV AIDS is spreading among Hispanic Americans now, mm -hmm. and where it wasn't as heightened as uh, 10 years ago as it appears to be now. So I think that we need a special program expanded to deal particularly in the African American community uh, with our churches and other community programs. And with that, uh, I'll say thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. and thank you, Dr. Thank Finn. You. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Uh, Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the panel. Um, I would imagine that just about any um, condition uh, can be treated or involves sort of two prongs at least in your strategy to combat it. One is, is sort of behavioral modification, the other is treatment. So, um, but obviously there's certain kinds of conditions, diseases, and so forth uh, where that interplay is more relevant and elastic. And um, so I had a couple of questions. Uh, is there any evidence where can you, can you describe how progress on the treatment front may, may have contributed to some backsliding on sort of the behavioral practice or modifying behaviors uh, front. Um, and if, if that has happened, um, you know, how, does, how, do, how do you address that? What are the strategies for sort of maintaining the intensity of the focus on both strands? without having them sort of contribute to 
you know, going in the opposite direction with the other. And, and along those lines, and this is my only question, so then I, I ask you all to, to just jump in. Are there, are there conditions uh, or diseases that have been uh, good reference points for you to look at where the analogy is strong enough in terms of what we're dealing with, with, with HIV and AIDS? that what's happened in terms of how we've managed those is instructive uh, in terms of the strategies that we're trying to employ with respect to uh, HIV and AIDS? Um, I'll, I'll start. Um, I think that the risk period for people, all other things being considered, for the highest chance of transmitting to others is very early after infection and then again very late in infection when the viral load is very high. But you can transmit at any time. So if treatment is successful in suppressing viral load, it stands to reason that people would be less infectious to others during that period of time. They also tend to change their behavior when they know they're infected and protect other people as a consequence of their disease. But we are experiencing anecdotal and I think more systematically a cohort of people who have falsely been reassured um, that their lives um, are going to be unaffected by this treatment and so there is some complacency and some recidivism in increase in risk behavior and we see that by indicators such as the incidence of rectal syphilis going up in some populations where there's been um, an increase in unsafe sexual practices. So that is a phenomenon. Um, there is, it's very difficult to find a good um, analogy to HIV in the context that you're asking the question. To some extent, TB is like that. You have to treat it for a long time and people become less infectious when they're on treatment. Um, they can be falsely reassured by the therapy early on and be less conscientious about infecting the people in their households. But AIDS is a pretty unique infectious disease, a chronic infectious disease for which we have a chronic infectious disease treatment. And so we're kind of learning as we go with this one. Yeah, just to underscore what you were saying about the perceptions, uh, the perception of something not being as bad as we decades ago thought it was. If you look at the environment that we're in, we used to have hospices and 20 to 40 percent of our hospital beds in some cities were occupied by people with HIV infection. It's mostly an outpatient disease right now. The public perceptions that put on the face of someone with HIV, if you look at some of the advertisements for some of the drugs, you open up medical journals and you page through the first 10 pages and they have these extraordinarily healthy looking people rock climbing saying, I'm doing very well on my a tripler or on my whatever, dr whatever drug combination they're on, it really creates a false impression that we've been trying to underscore here, and Dr. Gerberty mentioned it actually formally in our presentation, is the issue that it is a bad thing to get HIV infected. Uh, even though with all the, the very, very effective drugs we have, it is not a good thing. It's difficult to take the medications. It's a lifelong disease. If you stop, we've shown, as others have, that the virus bounces right back. And you, at this point in time, we've not been able to cure it. Did you attribute any of the increase that has been talked about here today to this, this sort of misperception? Or, or is it hard? I'm, I'm sure it's no. hard to draw a straight line. No, I, I, I think there's no, there's no question in, in, in our mind that when people practice risk behavior, if you question them and talk about it with them, a, a significant amount, I can't give you a number, is due to the feeling that it isn't as bad as it was back in the early 80s. Of course, there was an incredible amount of fear. I mean, if you were in New York City or San Francisco or Los Angeles or some of the other cities, the fear among the community, particularly the gay community, was palpable. There's much less of that now because of the perception that we can treat it very well. Thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Uh, without objection, uh, Representative Maxine Waters, who is not a member of our committee, is. Uh, uh, will, will be allowed to uh, sit with us uh, to enter a statement in the record and to ask questions. Without objection, that will be the order. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I am just so pleased that you are holding this hearing. Um, and I would like to thank you and uh, Ranking Member Tom Davis uh, for this hearing today. 
Um, I'd just like to give a little bit of background and ask a few questions. Uh, many people in the black community have long suspected that the epidemic was worse than our nation's leaders thought it was, even before the CDC's new estimates were released. We knew that African Americans accounted for about half of new, all of the new AIDS cases, and we knew that HIV AIDS was having a profound impact on African Americans. In 1998, we sounded the alarm in the halls of Congress. On April 24, 1998, while I was the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, the CBC held a brain trust, which was sponsored by Congressman Lewis Stokes. During that brain trust, CBC members were shocked by the presentation of Dr. Benny Prim, the executive director of the Ad Addiction Research and Treatment Corporation. Dr. Prim's presentation described a state of HIV AIDS crises in minority communities, particularly the black community. On May 11, 1998, the CBC held a meeting that brought together many public health workers, AIDS activists, and representatives from all over the country to tell us about the impact of HIV AIDS on minority communities. That same day, the CBC called for President Bill Clinton to declare a public health emergency to combat the crisis in minority communities. In the fall of 1998, Lou Stokes, Donna Christensen, and I met with uh, Donna Shalala, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, to discuss the crisis. We agreed that what we really needed was not a declaration of a public health emergency, but rather money for programs to address the crisis. On October 28, 1998, the CBC held an event to roll out the Minority AIDS Initiative. The event featured the participation of President Clinton, Secretary Shalala, and representatives of the HIV AIDS organizations from around the country. At the 1998 rollout, we announced that the Minority AIDS Initiative would receive an initial appropriation of $156 million in fiscal year 1999. The Minority AIDS Initiative grew significantly over the next five years, but since then, funding has remained stagnant at about $400 million per year since fiscal year 2003, and at some points it dropped below the $400 million. Having said that, African Americans, again, have been seriously and disproportionately affected by HIV AIDS. There are more than one half million African Americans living with HIV AIDS today. African Americans account for about half of all the new AIDS cases, although only 12 percent of the population is black. African American women represent somewhere between 66 and 75 percent of all the new AIDS cases among women, and African American teenagers represent 69 percent of all the new AIDS cases among teenagers. I could go on and on with this. Are you shocked about this crisis? Are you bothered about this crisis? Let me start with Dr. Julie Gerber. Does this, does this information shock you? As, as I um, said before you were here, I believe this is an urgent situation. Uh, am, am I shocked by it? I'm certainly not happy about it. Do you think it's it. a crisis? I think it is a crisis. Uh, Mr. Fenton? Are you shocked? Do you think this is a crisis? I'm saddened, and CDC has declared this as a severe and ongoing crisis among the community. You think it's a crisis? I do. Um, Dr. Anthony Fauci, do you think it's a crisis? Yes, I do, Ms. Waters. Okay, given that we all believe that this is a crisis, and th these statistics and this information is shocking, what do you recommend? Um, I would be happy to share the professional judgment budget that we have presented um, to this committee with you, which I think reflects three major fo focal areas. One is to um, know not just who got it then or who's getting it now, but who's going to get it if we don't act and invest in the systems that tell us what to do about that. Second is to get everybody diagnosed who's had it so they can in, uh, benefit from treatment. And the third is to put a significant effort into new research so we have, have new tools. CDC? Six years. Six years. Um, you heard my background on how I created the Minority AIDS Initiative. I created that because we needed to focus on building capacity and getting communities that had little or no resources involved in RFP processes. We've been working very hard, and I come here and I hear you, uh, Mr. Fenton, talk about all this great work you're doing with minority leaders in minority communities. I don't know about it. I've been involved in this issue for a long time, 
having created this and watching the incidence of HIV and AIDS grow in African American communities across the country. And I want to know, because I don't get a sense that you really feel this is a crisis. And when you tell me that, well, I submitted a budget, take a look at the budget, how have you sounded the alarm? What have you done to deal with this growing crisis? Do you see what I just said about African American teenagers from 13 to 19 years old, representing 69% of all the new AIDS cases among teenagers? Doesn't that bother you? Mrs. Waters, um, we will be briefing the um, Black Caucus this afternoon, but if you would be willing to participate in our enhanced initiative, we would love to have your voice because we need to get leaders involved in helping us. No, 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 no. We need your help. No. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. I am involved, and I have been involved. Wait, and the Black Caucus has been screaming to the top of its voice for help. We just got. It, one portion of this reauthorized with Ryan White. The other portions of the funding that we struggle with are not even official in the budget. What are you going to do about just getting a CDC portion authorized? It's spread out among several of these agencies, uh, including CDC and um, NIH and SAMHSA, and I don't see any leadership from it, I don't see any leadership from you. Now, I know that you think I'm being a little bit harsh, and I am. I happen to be an African-American woman. I don't want gays and lesbian and African-American men and women fighting about who's worse off. We're all worse off. And I don't like it when I go out into the communities and I see all of these little groups struggling and fighting and the way you deal with uh, discretionary money. We need some leadership. And I'm so pleased that I'm able to be here today, uh, Mr. Waxman, and I thank you for indulging me in my frustration. Thank you very much, gentlelady's time has expired. Uh, Dr. Fenton and Dr. Gerberding, one of, one CD, once CDC identifies effective programs, the next step is to disseminate them to the states. How does CDC identify effective programs? I'd like to ask um, Dr. Fenton to okay. take on this in detail, but just to um, tell you that um, the, there's a two-step process. One is to review the evidence of efficacy um, by expert scientists who are in a position to make those judgments, and we respect that, and to get that up in the compendium, which will be updated um, okay. again. But in addition, there's a process where, of diffusion where we work with an organization that trains and helps disseminate um, people. And right now, there's a bottleneck in that training, so that's one of the issues we addressed in our professional judgment budget. So, so you have a research team that applies a methodolo methodological uh, uh, review of studies of existing programs. They identify the ones that are found to work. You put it up on the compendium. Uh, it, it, uh, isn't that right? Yes, and then okay. we expect the grantees who receive our dollars when they're developing programs to use those programs that are proven to be effective. But in order for them to successfully implement them, they often need training and support. Right. And that's um, one of the areas that we are not able to keep up with right now. When the compendium was first released in 1999, CDC said it would update it annually as effective new programs were identified, and CDC's experts did identify a number of additional programs that work, but as I understand it, you said there was a bottleneck. CDC uh, did not issue annual updates to the compendium. Is that right? I, I can't go back to 1999, but we have done two updates since I've been the director of CDC. It's a little bit hard to do it annually because the data from these programs don't come forward that fast, but I think we are accelerating our ability to do that. Well, and when did CDC last issue an update on the compendium? Two, 2007. 2007. And uh, did CDC attempt to get HHS approval to release an updated compendium prior to that time? I believe we did. And uh, what was the response from HHS? Um, I'd have to ask Kevin, who wasn't the director at that time, to go into the details of this because I don't know all the steps involved. Um, we can provide that paper trail for you, but um, to suffice to say that um, it was not a speedy process. Okay. Uh, well, I'd like the answer for that to that question for the record, and I'd also uh, like to know why didn't HHS approve any updates of the compendium until 2007? 
I, I, I can't answer that, but okay. I, I can say that in the recent years we've had, a, I think, a much more accelerated process and I'm satisfied that we're able to do it in a timely way now. I hope that we'll have the update for 2008 before the end of this calendar year. Well, it took eight years to update the list with crucial information about programs that had been shown to save lives. And I'm concerned that instead of encouraging effective HIV, HIV prevention, HS seems, HHS seems to have been standing in the way. In fact, the committee asked CDC for a list of dates on which the compendium and other important HIV prevention documents were submitted to HHS for clearance and when they were actually released. And my understanding is that the committee hasn't gotten a response because CDC's response is still in clearance at HHS. <laughs> Does CDC provide training or technical assistance for implementing the programs that identifies? Yes, we do. And how many organizations are currently on the waiting list for the training? 2000. I think it's about 2,000. So 2,000 organizations out there want to provide identified, effective HIV prevention programs, but they're still on a waiting list. I think that's unconscionable given the statistics you've been, we've been hearing about today, and I think we need to address it. Uh, Dr. Gerberding, just a clarification of your testimony. You suggested that earlier that one of the reasons that you lowered your prevention goals is that there are more people with HIV living because of treatment. Uh, but the data for 2000 estimated 945,000 people living with HIV. And for the data uh, for the most recent year, uh, we find around a million people. This is about 5%. Does a 5% increase in people living with HIV produce an 80% decrease in your goal? and a 20% decrease in funding for preventions? I'm not going to be able to do that math in my head, but I think what you're getting to is, you know, what is the full picture of the recalibration? And I, again, I was on the advisory committee when we were struggling to develop that first 50% reduction. Um, we um, recognized at that time that the, there was a bell-shaped survival curve for HIV, so the projections were that we would see an escalation in death rates and that was factored into the projection of the transmission. So it was, a, you know, I, I don't want to say it would be easier to prevent if there were fewer people living because that isn't our public health goal, but the calculus was different then. Um, and that's not the only reason, as I already said, but that is one of the factors well, that is that different question. then as opposed to now. Because I, I was troubled by your, the answer you had given earlier, so I just wanted to pursue that point. I thank you for responding. Uh, this panel has been very helpful. Uh, I, I think it's unfair to, um, criticize the four of you uh, for what you're trying to do. I think you're trying to do the best you can and you're trying to do as much as you can without sufficient funds and without uh, the, um, the barriers to your efforts being uh, removed. And the purpose of having you here is not to criticize you but to try to be constructive in working with you to be sure that you have the ability to do the job because we're all very concerned and frustrated that there's so many people whose lives are at risk and will be lost unless we in government do what's needed. And if it's not coming from the U.S. government, it's not going to happen at all. I thank each of you for your testimony today. I want to now call forward, uh, what's it? I want to now call forward the witnesses for our second panel, Dr. Uh, David Holtgrave. Well, we'll, we'll wait a minute and uh, have the second panel. Come forward. Today, and I want to introduce uh, those of you on the second panel. Dr. David Holtgrave is founding chair and professor in the Department of Health, Behavior, and Society at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He has served as director of behavioral and social sciences at the Emory Center for AIDS Research and as director of intervention research at CDC's Division of HIV AIDS Prevention. Dr. Holtgrave has focused on the efficacy, effectiveness, and economic evaluation of a variety of HIV prevention interventions, contributing to over 175 professional publications. 
Dr. Adora Adamora is Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of North Carolina, School of Medicine and Adjunct Associate Professor of Epidemiology at the School of Public Health. She has been the principal investigator on multiple CDC and NIH funded research projects and has published extensively on the epidemiology of HIV in America with a focus on African Americans. Dr. Adamora is a practicing clinician and a fellow of the American College of Physicians. Dr. George Ayala works as a research psychologist and public health analyst at RTI International's Urban Health Program in San Francisco, California, is also the executive officer of the Global Forum on Men Who Have Sex with Men and HIV, he is a former director of health promotion, community research, and capacity building at AIDS Project LA, where he managed HIV prevention, technical assistance, and research, a clinical psychologist by training. Dr. Ayala's research focuses on the mechanisms through which social discrimination impacts health. Heather Hauck is the director of the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene AIDS Administration, leading statewide public health efforts uh, to reduce HIV transmission in Maryland and to help Marylanders with HIV AIDS live longer and healthier lives. Ms. Hauck is currently chair-elect of the National Alliance of State and Territorial AIDS Directors. She has served as the section chief of the STD HIV section for the state of New Hampshire and as a consultant on HIV program issues for hospitals, national associations, and state public health uh, agencies. Uh, Frank J. Oldham, Jr. is the executive director for the National Association of People with AIDS. He has spent over two decades as a leader in HIV policy, administering HIV programs for the cities of New York and Chicago and working in numerous AIDS service organizations. Mr. Oldham has served and is currently serving on several planning and other policy bodies, including the New York City Commission on AIDS, the National Minority AIDS Council, CDC's five-year strategic planning committee, and Lambda Lesbian and Gay Community Services. Uh, we're pleased to have you here today. Uh, I want to uh, inform you that uh, in this committee's practice, all witnesses that appear before us do so under oath, so we would like to administer an oath to you. If you would please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will indicate that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, your prepared statements will be in the record in full. We would like to ask, however, that you limit the oral presentation to five minutes and we will have a clock that will tell, tell you for four minutes uh, you're, it's green and the last minute it will turn orange and then when the time is up it will turn red. Dr. Holgrave, let's start with you. There's a button on the base of the mics. Be sure to press so that uh, we can hear you. Chairman Waxman, Representative Davis and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Today's hearing is truly urgent. CDC's HIV uh, incidence estimates suggest that there is a new infection every nine and a half minutes in the nation. There is an AIDS-related death every 33 minutes. The racial and ethnic health disparities are staggering. And the lifetime HIV care and treatment costs for one person can easily top $275,000. Because of the new incidence estimates, one might ask two key questions. Are HIV prevention programs effective and are they delivered at a sufficient scale in the U.S.? My answer will be yes to the first question and no to the second. To assess prevention effectiveness at the national level, we must examine HIV transmission rates. Obviously, HIV is spread from a person living with, a, with the virus to someone who is HIV negative. The transmission rate is the number of new HIV infections in a year divided by the number of people living with HIV in that year. As seen in this first slide, the HIV transmission rate dropped from over 92 in 1980 to 6.6 .6 in 1991. On the second slide, we see that the transmission rate stayed at roughly this level until 1997, when after the advent of new therapies, the transmission rate actually went up temporarily to 7.5. Thereafter, it declined once again. In 2006, the transmission rate appears to be just under 5. This means that over 95 percent of persons living with HIV in the U.S. are not transmitting the virus to someone else in a given year. Another key measure of prevention success is the difference between what we observed in the HIV epidemic and what would have occurred had prevention programs not been in place in slide three. 
From the beginning of the epidemic through 2006, I estimate very conservatively that roughly 362,000 infections were prevented in the nation and over 3.3 million quality adjusted life years were saved. There is a clear relationship between HIV prevention program funding and incidence as seen in the fourth slide. The bottom line is that in terms of HIV prevention investment, the nation gets what it pays for. One must be concerned, therefore, that when adjusted for inflation, CDC's HIV prevention budget has fallen over 19 percent since FY02, and in real dollar terms, the investment in the Minority AIDS Initiative is also in decline. Further, CDC's data shows that a small fraction of gay men in need of HIV prevention services report receiving them. Clearly, our investment in prevention is lacking. We must, therefore, scale up the use of evidence-based HIV prevention tools already at our disposal even as we hope for the development of new interventions such as a vaccine. As seen in slide 5, some currently available evidence-based HIV prevention interventions uh, are readily available to us. What is most important to emphasize is that we possess the technology to influence HIV-related risk behaviors and an extensive scientific literature leaves very little question on that point. So what is the right level of investment? I estimate that CDC's HIV prevention budget, now at $0.75 billion, needs to increase to about $1.32 billion per year and remain on average at that level for about four years at least so as to undo the damage done since FY02 and to address unmet HIV prevention needs in the U.S. What new services could be delivered at this higher level of investment? On the sixth and final slide, I list some of these. I believe it would provide sufficient resources to field a new, very large scale targeted HIV counseling and testing campaign, a nationwide public information and anti stigma campaign, intensive client centered evidence based prevention services for the minority of persons living with HIV who engage in any risk behavior that could result in transmission, and brief but science based interventions for 15 million HIV negative persons at risk of infection. What public health impact would this investment achieve? After four years of heightened service delivery, the U.S. could reduce HIV transmission rates by 50 percent and HIV incidence by 50 percent. Further, we could achieve and maintain a 90 percent level of serostatus awareness among persons living with HIV. This is a great fiscal investment. The cost per infection averted via this new heightened response would be roughly $27,000, and that indicates that prevention programs could easily save more medical resources than they cost to implement. But accountability is key. The proposed intensification of these programs must be accompanied uh, by a quick but careful review of current HIV prevention resources across the Federal Government, and we need a national AIDS plan. Further, the performance of all HIV prevention resources should be summarized in an annual report card so that mid-course corrections can be made. In conclusion, we are at a historic crossroads in the HIV epidemic in the U.S. Doing more of the same will achieve more of the same. And as asserted by a recent report of the Black AIDS Institute, the U.S. is indeed being, quote, unquote, left behind. But we can find the national will to scale up evidence-based HIV prevention programs sufficiently to change the course of the epidemic in the U.S. once and for all. Thank you again sincerely for your strong interest in HIV prevention. Thank you very much, Dr. Holtgrave. Dr. Adam Oder. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you. Could you uh, pull the mic a little closer and be sure the button is on? Can you hear me now? Yeah, good, thanks. So thank you for this opportunity to speak with you. I have been asked to testify concerning HIV epidemiology in the U.S., particularly with respect to African Americans and structural and social forces that affect individual and community vulnerability to HIV. These are some of the essential concepts. First, individual level sexual behaviors such as partner number and condom use don't completely explain racial disparities in U.S. HIV rates. Second, sexual network patterns are critical in the spread of HIV throughout the population. A sexual network is a set of people who are linked directly or indirectly through sexual contact. The distribution of network characteristics that promote population HIV spread, like concurrent partnerships and sexual mixing patterns, appears to differ by race in ways that increase HIV transmission among African Americans. Third, Social forces and social contexts, that is, social, macroeconomic, and other features of the environment that are outside the individual's control, contribute to sexual network, network patterns that spread HIV. So some potential pathways between HIV and several social forces are relatively clear. For example, residential segregation by race, supported by structural mechanisms like mortgage lending practices, concentrates poverty in the se segregated group. 
Segregation may, be, may especially influence young people's HIV risk since residents often dictate school districts which influence adolescents' social and sexual networks. Also, the sex ratio, or the ratio of men to women, is a key determinant of the structure of sexual networks. The sex ratio among Afri African Americans is strikingly low due to high mortality among black men and is further decreased by high incarceration rates. The relative scarcity of men contributes to low marriage and higher divorce rates. There's a strong association between being unmarried and having concurrent partnerships. Poverty. Another force works with the low sex ratio to help destabilize marriage and makes marriage less feasible in many black communities. The disproportionate incarceration of black men dramatically affects sexual networks in black communities. Incarceration disrupts existing par partnerships, making it more likely that each partner will have concurrent partnerships. While inmates are in prison, they can join gangs and forge new long-term links with antisocial networks. These new links can then connect members of high-risk subgroups to previously low-risk people and their networks. High incarceration rates contribute to increased unemployment in poor minority communities, shrinking the number of financially viable male partners, as well as the absolute number of men. Rod Wallace showed how macro-level forces shaped social context and AIDS death rates in, in a New York City borough. In the 1970s, New York's fiscal crisis prompted city agencies to embark on a deliberate policy of planned shrinkage of the populations in black and Hispanic neighborhoods. The plan involved withdrawing critical city services, including firefighting services, from poor areas that already ha had high fire rates. So neighborhoods burned, many people moved to other parts of the borough, and social networks and community structure were disrupted. What was presumably not anticipated were, when these policies were implemented were the changes in the geography of drug abuse that resulted from this migration and the resulting upsurge years later in HIV. So finally, the pathways between social forces and HIV suggest that continuing to focus prevention efforts solely on individual risk factors and individual determinants won't significantly impact HIV rates among blacks in the U.S. Certainly, the search for and implementation of effective biological and behavioral interventions must continue and must certainly be funded. However, public health research must also take into account the social forces that are driving the extraordinary racial disparity in HIV rates in this country. I believe several steps, among others, should be taken immediately. First, the HIV epidemic among African Americans should be formally declared a national emergency, and moreover, the U.S. should act as if the epidemic is a true national emergency by developing and appropriately funding an effective domestic HIV plan that addresses not only biological and behavioral interventions, but also the epidemic's social and economic roots. This will require involving clinicians and public health researchers as well as experts in sociology, economics, public si uh, political science, criminal justice, and other disciplines. Secondly, incarceration affects the health of black communities. Attention should be given to the markedly disproportionate incarceration of black men. Third, comprehensive sex education can be effective in reducing risky sexual behavior and should be given in schools. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Adamora. Dr. Ayala. Chairman Waxman and distinguished committee members, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today on the critical topic of HIV prevention in the United States. It is my privilege to be here with you today. Presently, HIV prevention in the U.S. lacks the resources and comprehensiveness that will significantly drive down HIV incidence rates, as has been de demonstrated by my esteemed colleague, Dr. Holgrave. I ask that you consider the following. Serious HIV-related health disparities, often fueled by stigma and discrimination, continue to undermine HIV prevention efforts in communities of color. Men who have sex with men continue to make up the majority of new HIV infections nationally across race and ethnicity, with black and Latino gay men especially hard hit. Only four of the CDC's 49 recommended evidence-based interventions specifically target gay men, and only one of them is designed to address the needs of gay men of color. In addition, and just as important to consider, are these facts. Substance abuse prevention and treatment are underfunded, 
and not routinely viewed as integral to overall HIV prevention efforts. Structural interventions are not commonly researched or endorsed even when sound science support their broad-based adoption, as is in the case with multi-component syringe access and disposal programs. Other, uh, other than new HIV treatments, we have not yet harnessed the full prevention potential of other promising biomedical interventions, including pre-exposure prophylaxis and microbicides. And many science-based prevention interventions are difficult for community-based providers to implement because they, are, they were tested under research conditions that are different from real life settings or tested on populations other than those currently most vulnerable to HIV infection. While HIV testing and treatment are crucial in our fight against AIDS, a singular focus on testing and treatment is inadequate and narrows an already sparse continuum of prevention strategies. We need a comprehensive national HIV prevention plan in the U.S. At its core, such a plan would, one, work to eliminate disparities in health access and stigma associated with HIV, drug use, and homosexuality. The personal benefits of knowing one's HIV status early are lost on those who must overcome the significant barriers to treatment and persistent stigma that keep so many away from care. Two, Target interventions to those most at risk to HIV exposure and keep a steady and respectful focus on the prevention needs of gay and bisexual men, substance users, and women at sexual risk. The alternative is that we accept silence and denial about sexuality, drug use, and economic inequality, permitting stigma and discrimination to compromise our prevention efforts. Three, Ensure that priority be given to expanding social science and intervention research aimed at gay and bisexual men, especially men of color. Four, make the prevention and treatment of drug and alcohol addiction central to our HIV prevention efforts. The risk for HIV infection is heightened by drug and or alcohol abuse. Five, research and adopt community sensitive structural interventions to complement behavior modification programs. Structural level changes buttress the gains in behavior change made through individually geared prevention interventions by addressing the social factors that were addressed by my colleague, Dr. Mora, that underline HIV vul vulnerability. Six, support continued HIV treatment, vaccine, and other biomedical interventions that are safe, ethical, and show promise of efficacy. And finally, seven, balance the policy of promoting prepackaged evidence-based HIV prevention interventions by supporting and evaluating more localized, bottom-up, and collaborative HIV prevention strategies. It is critical to respect on-the-ground responses to the HIV AIDS epidemic by protecting local control over how HIV prevention strategies are developed, researched, prioritized, and implement uh, implemented. In closing, HIV prevention efforts in general have not received the funding needs it needs to make them ubiquitous and continuous, nor have our resources been adequately targeted to reach those at highest risk for HIV infection. We need a comprehensive national HIV prevention plan in the U.S. that clearly calls for culturally relevant, multi-level combination approaches that are well-funded, targeted, and sustained over many years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ayala. Ms. Hawk. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Representative Davis, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to participate on this very distinguished panel. State health, AIDS, State health Department AIDS directors appreciate that this committee is focusing on domestic HIV prevention activities, especially in light of the CDC's release of the new HIV incidence estimates and the alarming rates of infection among African Americans and gay and bisexual men of all races and ethnicities. I will focus today on describing state health department HIV prevention portfolios, including the central importance of HIV AIDS surveillance. I will also share key recommendations from state AIDS directors for an HIV prevention response to end the epidemic in our nation. State health department HIV directors are responsible for implementing comprehensive HIV prevention care and treatment strategies in our states. We are stewards of more than half of CDC's $692 million budget for domestic HIV prevention and surveillance programs, as well as significant state resources. 
All states implement CDC's required HIV prevention program components, such as HIV counseling, testing and referral, partner services, health education, risk reduction, community planning, program evaluation. Over the past six years, however, CDC's funding to state and local health departments has decreased by $30 million. For many states, especially medium and low prevalence states, this decline in federal funding has re resulted in significant reductions in core components of HIV prevention services. At the same time, there has also been an increased directive from CDC to focus resources on HIV testing. When faced with such directives and funding reductions, states are forced to eliminate effective interventions that are needed to prevent HIV transmission in our regions or among our populations. HIV prevention efforts must be aligned to meet the needs of those who bear the greatest HIV AIDS burden in the U.S. As the recent CDC HIV incidence estimates clearly illustrate, African Americans, men and women, and gay and bisexual men of all races and ethnicities are significantly impacted by HIV. State and local health department HIV programs work to eliminate health disparities based on race, ethnicity, gender, sexual identity, and class. In Maryland, our data show that HIV largely disproportionately impacts African Americans, regardless of transmission risk category. And therefore, we prioritize the reduction of health disparities among racial and ethnic communities as a cross-cutting theme for all of our HIV initiatives. A central activity of state HIV prevention programs is measuring and describing the epidemic through HIV surveillance activities. These activities are essential to understanding our local HIV AIDS epidemics so that we can then target HIV prevention activities appropriately. These data also determine the allocation and distribution of resources for HIV care and treatment via the Ryan White program. The CDC has been unable to adequately sustain funding for core surveillance or for projects such as the incident surveillance projects which led to the new estimates released in August. For example, Maryland's total budget for HIV AIDS surveillance was reduced by 40 percent in the last year, and the state is no longer funded for incident surveillance. The loss of surveillance funds in states jeopardizes our ability to know the populations most impacted by the HIV epidemic. In Maryland, heterosexuals ages 30 through 49, disproportionately African American, and living in the Baltimore metro area, Prince George's, and Montgomery counties. If we can't describe our epidemics, we can't plan effective HIV prevention strategies and interventions appropriate for our local communities. The CDC needs additional funding to restore and expand incident surveillance and to shore up core surveillance across all jurisdictions. AIDS directors articulated our vision for America's prevention response in a new blueprint for the nation, ending the epidemic through the power of prevention, and copies have been made available to the committee. Three key elements are required to successfully reduce the number of new HIV infections. One, adequately fund CDC's HIV prevention and surveillance program at the level of at least $1.3 billion annually. Two, significantly invest in interventions that work to prevent infection, including research to develop new population-specific interventions, access to sterile injection equipment, enhanced programming correctional settings, and establishing comprehensive sexuality education as the standard. Three, meaningfully invest in programs that support HIV prevention, including STD treatment, hepatitis vaccinations, substance abuse prevention and treatment, mental health services, housing, and expanded research for biomedical interventions. State and local health departments know that HIV prevention works, and we know that health departments, health care providers, businesses, faith leaders, community-based organizations, and persons with living, living with HIV and AIDS must all be equipped with adequate tools and resources to help prevent new infections. Thank you again for holding this important hearing and for your thoughtful consideration of our recommendations to increase access to HIV prevention interventions provided by state and local health departments. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Ms. Hawk. Mr. Holden. Chairman, Chairman Waxman and the entire Oversight Committee, people living with HIV AIDS, thank you for your demonstrated leadership and an opportunity to speak with you about the state of HIV prevention in the United States of America. As the trusted and representative voice of more than one million people living with HIV AIDS in America, I say with great confidence that we know our status and that has enabled us to save lives. HIV-related stigma, and homophobia, homohatred continue to result in disproportionate HIV incidents among gay and bisexual men 
black and Hispanic men and women, and individuals challenged by poverty, incarceration, and mental illness. As a black gay man, a person living with AIDS, a proud American, I ask, is this acceptable in our America? HIV prevention can only succeed through access to evidence-based interventions, accurate information and education, protected and voluntary HIV testing and screening services, effective use of care, HIV care and treatment as prevention, reduced stigma and increased support for zero status disclosure, and by addressing structural, systemic, and economic barriers that continue to perpetuate HIV vulnerability among the most marginalized groups of, of Americans. This is the basis of support for our community's call for a national aid strategy that is coordinated, evidence-based, outcome-driven, and inclusive of people living with HIV AIDS. We've heard testimony from the Centers of Disease Control that annual HIV incidence has been as much as 40% higher than the past 15 years. Prevention efforts have been flat funded in our country for more than two decades, and the, and the Minority AIDS Initiative has not been funded adequately to address the real HIV needs in communities of color. As, an in as we increase resources for the Minority AIDS Initiative, we must be sure to hold organizations that receive M MAI funds accountable. We must scale up HIV prevention in America to an annual investment of $1.3 billion. This investment will prove to those at increased risk for HIV that we care about their lives. We hope that this will be a priority for the next administration. In the meantime, we urge an initial investment of $200 million for fiscal year 2009, the AIDS community's consensus request. Eight years of abstinence only until marriage programs have had dire human consequences. HIV risk reduction strategies such as comprehensive sex education and syringe exchange programs have been proven to reduce HIV infections, yet these interventions have not received the requisite level of federal funding. It is imperative that we make decisions based in science and don't sacrifice lives and waste already constrained resources on programs that have been proven to be ineffective. The vast majority of individuals aware of their status are making decisions about their health and behavior that are not contributing to the spread of HIV. And I repeat, that are not contributing to the spread of HIV. Diagnosis, care, and treatment is effective HIV prevention, and our lives depend on it. This, this is all the moral reason why we must ramp up our efforts to make sure people are aware of their HIV status. 16 years ago, the National Association of People with AIDS launched National HIV Testing Day because we believe that taking an HIV test makes it possible for people to protect themselves and their loved ones. NAPO supports increased and targeted HIV testing at-risk populations, routine opt-out screening for HIV in medical settings, and strongly believes there is an obligation to link people who test positive to high-quality care, treatment, and support services. The Kaiser Foundation continues to report that 45 to 55 percent of those with HIV are still not in care. 45 to 55 percent of people who have HIV are not in care, whether by passing the early treatment of for HIV Act, our efforts to reform health care, America must ensure access to comprehensive and coordinated care for all persons living with HIV AIDS. Aggressive research and treatment advances have helped more people live with HIV than ever before. The benefits of this research extend beyond HIV. CDC needs more resources to do the requisite research and work on the ground. The HRSA, the National Institutes of Health, and the substance abuse and health agencies also need appropriate resources to identify new research opportunities and collectively further expand the toolkit of prevention strategies. Perceptions of, stim of, of stigma, stigma directly impact an individual's willingness to be open about their HIV status. NAPWA invites more leadership from all sectors of American society and life to increase the visibility of people living with HIV and AIDS and oppose stigma stigmatizing or negative language toward them. This is especially true in minority communities, the gay community, and all communities challenged with social and economic inequality. The critical issue of AIDS in America must be a political priority for all of us. N 
NAPWA supports HIV prevention activities that are culturally and gender specific. NAPWA supports community mobilization strategies for all communities disproportionately impacted by this disease and will launch the first national gay men's HIV awareness day on September 27th later this month in Raleigh, North Carolina. The day will seek to accomplish increased awareness about the needs of gay men for HIV prevention, care and treatment, forums to, to strategize effective responses to the epidemic in our community. We ask your, your support on this historic day, Gay Men's HIV Awareness Day, September 27th. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Oldham. Thank, uh, thank, I want to thank all of you for your testimony. Uh, Dr. Holgrave, you prepared for us your idea of what a budget should be for HIV uh, prevention. And it seems like uh, what you suggested is pretty much in the same ballpark as what CDC uh, said to us was their best professional judgment. Would you say that's an accurate statement? Uh, I would say so. I, I would say there's more points of agreement probably than disagreement. I think that mm -hmm. um, the central message probably from both is that we need to substantially scale up our investment in HIV prevention and also that it is achievable to think about reducing transmission rates and incidents by 50 percent in the U.S. and that it will take some years to do so. I think um, some of the difference in terms of the 1.3 billion versus say the 1.7 billion or so that CDC called for is that they have some um, uh, research funds some uh, activities on STD, TB, and hepatitis, which are very important, but that allows for some of the difference. And also, I think we could even be a little bit more aggressive and achieve the 50 percent reduction a bit sooner than CDC has estimated. But again, I think there's much more to agree than disagree between the two estimates. Well, both you and CDC suggest that we could be preventing many more HIV infections uh, than we can't, that we're doing now. Uh, as well as increasing the proportion of people who know their HIV status, which of course goes together. Do you think that the two estimates reflect a general consensus among HIV experts that better outcomes are within reach even based on current knowledge? Uh, I think so. I believe that there's a general consensus uh, scientifically that we have an outstanding array of tools, uh, some of which that Dr. Fauci mentioned earlier, that are available to us now. And we need to make sure that we're using those tools. Uh, we must develop vaccines, we must develop microbicides, but we need to use immediately what we have available at our disposal. Thank you. Dr. Adamora, I thought your presentation was very interesting. You presented uh, a perspective that I hadn't heard before uh, within the African American community. Uh, one of the aspects of the African American community, especially those who have HIV and AIDS, is that they live, many of them, if not most of them, live in poverty. Uh, how does poverty contribute to HIV risk for African Americans? Push the uh, button on the mic. There are a variety of uh, pathways between, between poverty and HIV and population HIV transmission. Um, in fact, I would consider this to be not, consider the culprits to be not only poverty but also racial discrimination. Um, among the pathways that, that I mentioned were segregation, um, and I mentioned some of the ways by which it works in terms of uh, structuring people's social and sexual networks. Particularly uh, alarming are the, is the way in which it can structure the sexual networks of youth. Uh, another issue concerning poverty is uh, homelessness. Um, homeless people are particularly at risk for HIV. Uh, I mentioned just a few of the potential structural interventions that could, be, uh, could, that could be implemented, but I think that attention to homelessness and improved housing is, is certainly a major consideration, and that relates certainly to poverty. Um, another issue is incarceration, uh, given the disproportionate incarceration of black men. Uh, and I think that it's important in thinking about incarceration. I, there's sometimes a tendency to uh, start talking about mandatory text testing in prison. Certainly everyone should have available to them uh, a means for learning their HIV diagnoses and for appropriate treatment. But in addition, I think that you know, incarceration is actually a major symbol of, the, of racial discrimination and oppression in this country. Uh, and there needs to be significant attention needs to be paid to it because of the myriad uh, consequences that it, it's having. Well, certainly it's wrong in the first place. But the other issue is that it's clearly having an impact on the health of people, particularly black people. Um, you mentioned incarceration in your uh, original presentation to us, and you said not only are people getting HIV when they're incarcerated, but there, there's a, a social disruption 
that imprisonment uh, causes. And I thought that was an interesting point. Do you see uh, uh, bias, uh, 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 racial bias, as well as uh, discrimination among gay and bisexual men in the black community as factors that are important for us to take note of? Unquestionably. There are pathways between racial discrimination and HIV infection. This is beyond a matter of simply social justice because that is a good thing. The absence of social justice is a major root cause of some, many of the racial disparities in health that we're seeing in the United States, and specifically of HIV infection. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ayala, do you have recommendations on how programs should take into account the specific uh, needs of gay and bisexual men of color? Um, as I said in my testimony, very, very few of the recommended prevention interventions are specifically designed or geared to men of color, gay men of color. Um, I think we have to do two things. One, we have to invest in uh, a, a greater research portfolio that um, build HIV prevention uh, interventions that are specifically geared to gay, gay men of color. And the second thing is that we should take what we have available and tailor them uh, for use in the communities, uh, both for the, the target population in question, but also with consideration to the needs of providers who have to ultimately implement the, the, the interventions. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Hawk, uh, at the state level, uh, you stated surveillance, measuring and monitoring the HIV AIDS epidemic is crucial to HIV prevention efforts. Uh, the the, the, the um, surveillance data not only helps you understand the epidemic, but appropriately targeting resources and I asked, understand that Maryland was among eight states that actually lost funding, and you mentioned this in your opening statement, to conduct the kind of new incidence measurements on which the CDC based its recent estimates. Uh, what has been the impact of this cut on Maryland and other states? Thank you for the question. Um, what happened at the state level um, was that our uh, surveillance activities had been integrated. Um, so we certainly received funding for core surveillance, which is really the basics of HIV surveillance and AIDS surveillance. And then we received uh, these uh, funding for these projects, and we had integrated all of the activities so that we were really gathering information um, in a holistic way about our epidemic. When you start to peel off uh, special projects that have been integrated into your core surveillance activities, you're no longer able to fully fund the staff that are gathering the information. You're not able to uh, do the data collection that we need um, to the level that we need the data in order to accurately describe our epidemic. So we may be missing some important components um, like risk. Um, uh, transmission categories like race, like, the, like ethnicity, as well as p potentially missing cases um, because it is uh, a rather intensive process to gather this information through our surveillance activities. Um, so I think over time what you'll see is that states aren't able to sustain even our core surveillance activities, which again allow us to describe our epidemics and therefore use that funding to allocate, distribute, and plan prevention, as well as care and treatment services um, in our jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. CDC uh, presented, us to, uh, presented to us their professional judgment of what uh, their budget should look like, and uh, they would request more funding to strengthen behavioral and clinical surveillance activities in the states. Do you um, think that they have adequately uh, funded that uh, aspect when in their professional judgment budget? Um, the National Alliance of State and Territorial AIDS Directors certainly um, uh, states that at least an investment of $35 million in additional funding for surveillance is needed to both restore the cuts in surveillance that we've seen over time as really bring all of jur the jurisdictions um, up to uh, standard operating uh, budgets. Dr. Fenton in the first panel testified about the importance of integrating HIV services with services for other sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, and I want to ask you about that at the state level. Since 2000, the rate of syphilis in the U.S. has increased by 76 percent. As you know, this epidemic is primarily concentrated in the southeastern region of the U.S. among heterosexual African Americans and men who have sex with men. Uh, what will the states need to do to eliminate syphilis in these impacted populations, and should those efforts be coordinated with HIV 
HIV prevention efforts? Thank you for asking the question, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I'll answer the, the first part first. Um, yes, the uh, CDC's uh, budget for STD prevention has suffered uh, many of the same um, declines that the HIV prevention budget um, has suffered over the years. Um, Maryland is a, a southern state um, as well and has certainly seen um, um, a significant syphilis epidemic, especially in Baltimore City and Prince George's County, um, among uh, African Americans, particularly men who have sex with men and heterosexuals. Um, and yet our funding has not kept pace with our need to address the syphilis epidemic in our state and certainly the majority of states um, that have had a syphilis epidemic. Um, so I would say that the increase in resources is also needed. Um, and we do integrate and do need to continue to integrate STD prevention and HIV prevention. Um, um, at the state level and at the local level. Um, many of the clients who come uh, to seek services um, certainly need uh, to be given similar messages, similar education, similar screening, and need to receive that in a holistic manner when they walk in the door of a clinic or an emergency room or a community-based organization. And we need the resources to enable the clients to receive those services at the time when they seek them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have. Um infection rates continuing to rise among men who have sex with men. And uh, in the meantime, discrimination and marginalization of men who have sex with men remains widespread. Mr. Oldham, how does discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation affect gay and bisexual men who are living with HIV? And have any national campaigns in the U.S. HIV, HIV prevention directly addressed this kind of discrimination? There have been campaigns from community-based organizations uh, such as Gay Men's Health Crisis, the LA Gay and Lesbian Center in uh, Los Angeles, and uh, AIDS Project Los Angeles. Uh, however, there has not been the, 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 the governmental campaigns. Like, for example, we have National Black AIDS Awareness Day, Chairman Waxman. We have uh, National Hispanic AIDS Awareness Day, and, and a number, there are 12 of them. Even though the new CDC numbers indicate that gay men of all ethnic backgrounds make up the bulk of the epidemic and the loss of life in the epidemic, we do not even have a gay men's HIV AIDS Awareness Day, which is why NAPWA is launching this on the 27th to make sure that gay men are, aware, are involved in this epidemic and not complacent about it themselves and the rest of the society deals with the issues of homophobia and homo-hatred as barriers to HIV prevention and care services for gay men. Well, I want to thank all of you on this panel for your presentation and your willingness to answer questions. We may have a member submitting to you additional questions of which you may uh, respond to in writing for the record because I know many members had a lot of things that they wanted to pursue, but there are so many competing things going on that not everybody can be here. I, I think the purpose of this hearing has, has been to uh, sound an alarm because we have a, an increasing HIV ep epidemic in the United States. It's different than where we were in the early days, but it's very much with us. And unless we set the high priority uh, to do the things we know that will work and to try to research and develop new uh, ways of approaching the epidemic, we're going to fall further and further behind. We know that when budgets are sent to us, they're budgets that are developed ultimately by the budget people in, in the administration. Uh, they may get the input from the agencies and the experts, but they're trying to figure out their overall priorities. And the overall priority for this administration has not been to deal with the HIV AIDS epidemic in the way that we need to, to stop uh, the, and prevent the uh, transmission of this disease. That's why I was pleased to have CDC and a NIH present to us what their best professional judgment would be. That's always different when you ask that uh, than what they have to say to us when they're uh, making presentations before Congress, because then their presentations have to be with, consistent with the views of the administration in which they serve. Well, I think that uh, presentation to us and your uh, expanded discussion of the, of the groups that are primarily affected and, and all the complications that we need to be aware of is going to help us uh, face this epidemic and I hope defeat it. Thank you very much for your presentation. That uh, concludes the, uh, the presentations at this hearing and we stand adjourned.
Great, it's good. Shoot. Today, American University holds a forum on the new presidency and the press. From CBS, Bob Schieffer joins political consultant Dottie Lynch, plus politics writers and media analysts. Live coverage at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on our companion network, C-SPAN.